everybody. I will call our meeting to order at 6.30 p.m. Um, it's good, good to see such a, a large turnout tonight. Um, <clears throat> I will start by going over a little bit of the meeting logistics. Anyone who is uh, participating remotely, please change your uh, name display to indicate your first and last name so we have a record of, uh, of who is addressing us. Um, <clears throat> anyone who wants to speak, you must be recognized by the chair to, uh, before you speak. And uh, please state your full name and where you live. So again, we have a record of uh, who's, uh, who's here and who's addressing the council. We'd ask whenever you speak, you keep your comments to uh, three minutes. And if you're speaking about a specific agenda item, please uh, limit your comments to that agenda item. Um, and if you speak out of turn, discuss non-germane topics, go on too long, etc., you may be interrupted and asked to adjust your comments. Uh, the first item on the agenda is to approve the agenda. Are there any changes to the agenda? And I hope everybody got that today. You're going to have to speak up because we have a, some noise. <coughs> Please. And there's just one addition to the agenda for the road closure for College Street for Holland. And folks in the room, um, it's, it's hard to be heard in this room. So really, I ask you to have no conversation uh, other than what's going on in the meeting. If you need to talk, about something with someone else's in attendance, please step outside. Um, okay, <clears throat> next item on the agenda is general business and appearances. This is an opportunity for any member of the public to uh, make a comment to the council on any subject that is not on tonight's agenda. And again, you will be called on and uh, uh, Councillor Bate will help us keep the uh, Keep your comments to three minutes. <clears throat> Tina, come on up. John, I'm out of order already, but I want to add if uh, Tina must be. If it's possible, the majority, a lot of the people here are for item number eight, and I wonder if you would consider moving it up on the agenda. Mm -hmm. I think that makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, anyone here for general business and appearances? And again, this is for people who are commenting on something that is not on the agenda. I don't see anyone online uh, seeking to be recognized, and I don't see anyone in the room seeking to be recognized. So the next item on the agenda is the consent agenda. And for those of you who aren't here all the time. <clears throat> this is for items that are uh, expected to be non-controversial and be able to be supported without uh, without debate. So any proposals that we take anything off the consent agenda, or are we ready for a motion? I move we accept consent agenda as presented. Second. Any discussion? I should point out. You want to point out the. Uh, the one uh, addition uh, uh, under item G, street closures approval, uh, we got a late request, uh, a request late today to, to add an item that for ha Halloween to close uh, College Street from East State Street all the way up to, uh, to the end. And uh, public safety supports that. So that's part of the proposal. We've typically done that. Anyway, just the police department using their sort of safety powers have blocked off the street during Halloween. There's so much foot traffic that trying to have cars go through there, it's not safe. So we fully support that. All right. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, thank you. Now let's move right to item eight. Uh, proposal from the membership of the Montpelier Senior Activity Center. 
Yes. Oh, we didn't really clarify, but when you get this, it means you have one more minute. And when you get this, it means you at three, you really should stop. Thank you. Good evening. I am Johanna Nichols. Thank you for making the time for members of the Montpelier Senior Activity Center to address you with our concerns. We do understand that everyone is trying to rebuild the city from the flood disaster. We acknowledge that the city is facing financial challenges and we appreciate the efforts to support our senior population. I was the program assistant at MSAC from 2011 to 2014. The Senior Center is a major reason why I retired home to Montpelier four years ago, because I knew that MSAC was here for support, just as it supports the majority of residents in Montpelier, many whom you see here this evening who are preparing for a healthy retirement and those beginning to experience the normal effects of aging. For some of our older members, COVID is not over. They are still afraid to come out. As the quote by Haruki Murakami that was posted in the window of the drawing board says, when you come out of the storm, you won't be the same person who walked in. At the annual meeting in June, the MSAC director announced that she was leaving. Members were told that the position would not be filled that a team would assess the MSAC programs and budget, and that the director of the Recreation Department would provide oversight to MSAC. In two town hall meetings last August, and in a forum with the city manager in September, members stated clearly that we need a qualified, focused director for MSAC. If, as the city says, the MSAC director position is not working, it may need modification, but the city's proposal to reassign parts of the position is not a solution, nor is it a solution to reclassify the position. The city might ask what support the current position needs to succeed. Instead, the city is proposing to replace the MSAC director with a program and membership director. That term is misleading and may be confusing. We are not seeking a program staffer. While we think program staff is a necessary assistant position, we believe we need the professional, knowledgeable director which so many seniors referenced at the two town halls. I'd like to step back to 2010 when the Senior Services Coordinating Committee, or SSCC, really, <laughs> was formed at the request of the council to bring forward a vision for the future of the senior center. Um, well, I think um, the vision and values of the senior center stated clearly in the report to the council and approved by the city council in April 2011 established the position of a strong director with parity to the directors of parks and recreation and led to a vibrant community center. I suppose... Uh, you do have your written statement, but yeah, you're three and a half minutes now. Oh, so I have, we have five. No, no, oh, three. Oh, we have three. Okay. Sorry. Right, fine. Thank then you, thank you can read it up. Yeah. No, I'm sorry. Remember the council have any okay. questions? Sorry. Okay. Thank you for the Thank you. Any, is there anybody else who wants to address us on this topic? And just just step right up. Sure. Yes. We need to make sure we get you recorded and online. Yeah. Uh, I'm George Olson, a resident 
uh, of uh, Montpelier, a member of the Montpelier City Activity Center, aka MSAC, MCAC, MSAC. MSAC's a bargain, I think. Uh, we receive about 1% of the city budget, which covers about 25% of our expenses. The remaining 75% comes from uh, revenue generated from membership classes and uh, some fundraising. But I'm not here tonight to talk to you about the fundraising, uh, fundraising mechanism. Like the city after the pandemic and flood, our goal is to rebuild. To do that, we need to hire visionary, experienced leadership that supports the mission of the Senior Center. Recent history showed us that due to divided responsibilities, the membership declined 32% over the past two years, that's post-pandemic, from 1,124 to 757. And classes have dropped from a high of 150 to about 45. I'm asking the city council to support hiring a director, a dedicated director, whose experience and background focuses on the senior center only. Thank you very much. Anybody else? My name is Bill Dolger. Um, by way of explaining why the MSAC needs a director, I would like to give a thumbnail history. 20 years ago, my wife, who grew up in Montpelier, and I retired and moved from the Boston area to take care of her father, Stretch Norman Doe, a World War II vet. He had been widowed for two years, and his health was failing. His idea of dinner was Chef Boyardee in a can for a hot dog. Vital to his activities was drum playing at the senior center in the swinging over 60s band. I would come and watch him play and have lunch. The center was a somewhat sleepy place when I, would, when I first saw it. Membership was not robust and we had no way of tracking that. There was a TV going most of the time and a few people coming and going. The building was in need of a major re renovation. Um, uh, for example, there was a huge old boiler with asbestos around the pipes and one thermostat for the whole building. Then there was a fire. <clears throat> then there was. Uh, Then there was, uh, um, I'm sorry, then there was a, a growth in programming and activity began picking up. The TV actually came out and retired folks noticed what was happening and started coming to sign up for classes. At the same time that classes were increasing, we charged a relatively small fee for membership and membership and classes grew. Then in 2009 there was a fire that allowed for a complete renovation and the addition of 14 apartments. I served on the Senior Services Coordinating Committee in 2010 and 2011 and participated in raising money for a capital campaign and served, as finance com for, served on the Finance Committee. Because of its many aspects, managing the MSAC is a complex and caring task that uh, not many can do. As we prepared to return to our new quarters, our planning led to the elevation of our director to a department head. Growth became even more vigorous. One quarter we offered 119 classes or events. The budget grew and it seemed to me that the city appropriation to fund the MSC might not be needed. Membership nearly reached 2,000. I should point out you're within your last minute. Okay. Um, some people moved to Montpelier just because of our senior center. We believe that the MSAC was the best senior center in Vermont. Then we lost our experienced director and the pandemic hit. Stretch and I were moving, we're driving down Main Street and he turned to me 
to say that he did not know anyone anymore. He worked for Prudential for 40 years and knew most of the population of Montpelier. Now his friends were either dead or largely confined to their homes. The challenges of getting older can be met with protecting one's health. Three minutes. What? Is it? Yeah. Time. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Is there anyone else in the room who'd like to be heard? I'm Nancy Schnulls. I have no prepared remarks, but I was anticipating, without knowing how this works, that the two individuals who did have prepared remarks would have more time, but I understand. Um, I have been active in the Senior Center since I was in AmeriCorps in 2001. Over the year, over the past uh, almost 30 years, I have been an instructor there, a volunteer there, a member there, a donor, a student. I know many of us don't know about the amazing facets of Montpelier if we're not personally involved in them. If you haven't been to the Senior Center to take classes, to teach, to have meals, to be a part of the fabric, you won't have a clue as to how important this place is to so many of us. It's critical to the health and well-being of so many, and I I imagine you all have seen the statistics about how many of us in Montpelier, I believe it's 42% or something, are over the age of 50. As our boomer demographic ages, that place is going to become even more important. So we ask you, we are a small sliver of the city's budget. Please allow us to have a dedicated director. Please put that in the, as a line item in the fiscal year 25 budget. It's, it's just essential to the future of the center. Thank you. Now, I think I saw someone else getting up or raising a hand. In, in the past, we've had people with problems with people falling asleep in the meeting, so we've made special arrangements to make sure that doesn't happen. I'm Deb Robinson. I just have one point I want to make, and that's that we're talking about a population who many who live alone, and the pandemic was particularly difficult for folks who lived alone because they lost the ability to meet with other people, and, and I think many of us are paying the price of that. We come out of the pandemic and find out we're talk they're talking about the place where many of us went to meet other people is going to be losing a director means losing programs. And it will be devastating, I think, for this particular population of our city. And I think that reason is something that needs to be considered as you're thinking about what, what the future of, of MSAC is. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Tina, looks like you want to sp step up. Tina Muncy again. I, I don't have anything to say. I'm just curious about your process. So this was an item on your agenda. You heard the comment, and um, somebody spoke to it, and then there are comments. What happens next as far as what the council does with this request? We will hear from the city manager, and then we'll have discussion. OK. Thank you. You're welcome. OK. Is there anyone else who'd like to be heard? Kim. Uh, 
a bit louder. I think I, seeing that people are having a hard time hearing. I just want to tell you what the senior center's meant to me. I guess for about 80 years I get up in the morning and people tell me what to do. Go to school, learn how to do this, join the Navy, do that. And then suddenly you're a senior and you retire and you haven't anything to do. Well, you can go to the senior center, as I did, take a class in watercoloring and renew your ability to paint that you gave up 15 years ago. You can uh, work on your physical education and take a bone building course and, um, and keep your physical status all right. Um, and if you're curious and wonder whether you can write something, you can go to a course and it'll teach you how to write a book. And if you tire of that, you can go and have a congregate meal and talk with people about all kinds of things that you would never meet. And in short, they can save your life. Don't, don't let it stop. Thank you. Thanks, Ken. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Mary Alice Bisbee online. And, and then why don't you come on up so we'll, okay. we'll get you next. Mary Alice, you'll need to be unmuted. Unmuting, I think. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? I didn't know anything about this. Uh, uh, was coming up tonight, but I... Uh, want to put in a word that I am lonely. I miss my senior center. I miss my meals. The meals are the most important thing. We used to have twice a week meals. Now it's down to one or twice a month. And uh, I hope we can get the food system back working the way it was. The person that was hired for a chef made the meals for us. And um, I think for, for those of us, I'm 86, I think for those of us in our 80s, we should have meals and we shouldn't be expected to have to pay $15 for every meal. Some of this should come from the city. So I think that if this is about the budget, then I'm all for making as much of a, a, a commitment for the senior center as you're able. Thank you. Thanks, Mary Alice. My name is Diane Beccario. I live in Montpelier, and I'm the chair of the advisory council at the Senior Center. And I think um, if I repeat anything that other people said, I'm sorry, we couldn't quite hear in the back. But I think Mary Alice and some of the other comments you might hear also, to me, really reveal the many functions and the real meaning of the Senior Center. And therefore, because they're so varied, you. You know, we do, uh, people have been mentioning programs and meals and all sorts of things. And that means that the person who's the director has a lot of responsibility. There's a lot of balls in the air. We've had a director over a number of years. And I just want to, you know, again, emphasize that the city has proposed a, a lesser position, a program director, with other parts of the, um, what was originally the director's position now moving over towards uh, the rec department's head, um, Arnie McMullen. It feels like um, there are ways to support that position, the original director's position that would make sense as opposed to taking away some of the partial responsibility. And we really think that the person who's our director needs to be 
equal to the other directors within community services, um, that there are ways to support that position so that they can accomplish the work. And they have in the past. There's been, I think as um, Johanna said, since 2011, there's been a director. And it's, it's worked quite well. We took a real dive, as everyone did during the, during the um, pandemic. And we're just slowly getting back to that. Um, we actually had a fairly successful year. I know the budget is just what's on everyone's mind. But last year, the budget shortfall for the, for the senior center, even though it, a few months earlier it looked pretty bad, it was only a few thousand dollars. So we actually made up for that. There was a lot of grant writing and, and a lot of work done. But the financial piece is not as severe as we thought it was. I don't know if Bill would, will agree with that. Um, but back to the position, we just feel that it needs to be a full-blown director position that it does. It's very, very uh, multifaceted. There's a lot to do. Someone we hire is not going to be great at everything because it's got so many, as you know, so many um, aspects. So one thing we would propose is figuring out ways to support that position. If someone comes in and they're not like a whiz about a budget, but they can do all everything else about the job well, and they really understand what we need, that that person could get some support in, in terms of training to, d to develop a budget. So um, I guess that's really, I just wanted to clarify what the differences are, because we've heard the word director in one usage and then the word director in another. And I just want to straighten out that that's what we're looking at. And we want the director to be, as they were, a full-fledged director and figure out how to support them best. So thank you very much. Thank you. I want to make sure everyone, yes, come on up. Thank you. I'm uh, Barbara Thompson, and I live at Westview Meadows. I would like to point out the number of people who are here this evening. I think they speak, that speaks more volume, more words than I could say about the importance of the Senior Center to this community. It is a vital part of an active civic engagement. And I think you would be very much mistaken to cut back on its budget and not to have a, uh, an executive director to help it grow and continue to grow. Thank you. Thank you. I'm scanning the room. If there's anyone else, please step up. Hi. Hi. My name is Ann Ferguson, and I live in Montpelier on North Franklin Street. Uh, I worry about, well, I worry a lot, but I worry about, I, I worry about men. And I worry because so many men um, uh, don't make uh, the transition from work to retirement very smooth for them. Um, and I think one of the things that I've seen happen at the Senior Center is opportunities for men in particular to come and join in. You know, women, we're great. We're really good about being with each other and, and stuff, but men have a harder time, and I'm sorry, and I'm, but they come to trash tramps, all right? Is that awesome or what, right? And they, they come and they play music, and they're just so important that this part of our population not feel like um, that it's, that it's so important that they in particular feel welcome to come. And so I think the programming person that runs the, the senior center has to really have a good understanding of the special needs of the population. You know, not just men, but also people that are dealing with a, a loved one that is struggling with a disease. Or the, the, the difficulty that everyone experiences through grief and loss. These are really important, important issues, and I think that they should, they should be uh, addressed well by someone who knows what they're doing. And that's why I think we need a dedicated director. Thank you. Uh, 
Hi, I'm Nancy Monell. <clears throat> I live on Pearl Street in Montpelier. And um, I missed half of what was being said because my hearing aids aren't tuned loud enough. Um, so this is a typical senior moment for me. But uh, I just wanted to say that not only can we get back to where we were in terms of vitality, but the senior center can go way beyond that. I mean, I heard Mary Alice in one of the group meetings we had talk about what about transportation? Do we have, could we have somebody who actually can make a list of people in a class or for a special event that can give rides and people that need to receive rides. That takes a lot of work. It requires, it, it's one of many things that require the kind of director that is really focused on the senior center. And I can't talk loudly because I was a teacher for 25 years a room like this does not intimidate me, but um, we really, uh, the breadth of classes that we have is wonderful as it is, but there are so many more opportunities of things to teach and people to recruit and events that we can have to get together, and it's so important to our lives. So, thank you. Thank you. I'm Allison Underhill. I've been an executive director of a few organizations around Montpelier Ferry. And I know that unless you are devoted and understand what your organization is all about, you can't really put the effort into writing grants and, and um, coordinating and making that organization better. And uh, that's why I think we really do need to have a separate executive director at um, the Senior Center. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, come on up. Good evening. This is Nolan Carver from 11 Winter Street. Um, I'm here because I'd like to share um, my perspective as a psychiatric survivor. Um, what, how do I, you know, spend my days, you know, living on my disability paycheck, you know, um, pursuing my health? Um, it's been nice uh, getting involved with the trash tramps and the seniors there. Um, they seem to have a civic consciousness that is appropriate, and for me, it's really been. Um, a lifesaver, um, really, almost literally, um, just to have a, um, a volunteer occupation, uh, something to talk about. Um, I've experienced isolation uh, most of my life, actually. Uh, it's been hard living with anxiety, um, you know, asserting myself, whether it's work or volunteering or even just socializing. Um, I found a resource in another way and the Sunrise House at Washington County Mental Health uh, to be um, um, a good start. Um, it's not something that I can necessarily rely on, only because um, there is just a uh, like difference in culture compared to the Senior Center and an organic grassroots psychiatric survivor place, um, the Senior Center to me looks like an exclusive, beautiful resort club, almost, in a way compared to other items. You know, um, you've got clean floors in there, you've got a smiling face to greet you, a professional, you know, um, the meals, at least you have some elbow room, et cetera, et cetera. So I was wondering if there was any room for incorporating uh, the disabled community, including psychiatric survivors with the seniors and with the city uh, ultimately uh, evolve um, to uh, uh, support one another. It seems to me a essential civic sort of issue it, uh, that hits deeply 
I think, into the fabric of our own democracy. We need to see each other, and we need actually uh, to support one another. Thank you. Thank you. OK, I see things are kind of dying down. I don't want to prematurely cut off discussion, but I, unless you're stepping forward, I'm assuming that we don't have anyone else seeking to be heard. OK, well, thank you. And I don't see anyone else online. Um, So, Bill, I'm going to pa pass it to you. Oh, I'm sorry. We do see. I do see someone, and Charles, online. And you're going to wait. Need to wait till you can be unmuted. Can we tell? Or can well, let's. Up uh, oh, here we go. I think this person may be trying to get back on. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, thank you. I'm I'm sorry. I was late coming to the meeting, and I apologize for that. Um, and I'm delighted that the city council is taking up this matter of grave concern. I'd like to remind you all, if this hasn't been said, that we had several um, meetings with uh, Mr. Frazier and his staff uh, that were designed to be information meetings. And at these well-attended meetings, the community, the attendees with one voice said, we need a new independent director for all, for all the reasons that I'm sure have been voiced so far. And I find it very frustrating that subsequent to that, a call went out for instructors of classes with Director Arnie. It was like the decision had been made despite the public informed vigorous feedback. So I appreciate the city council taking this up again, and I really hope you reconsider what a, a very misguided uh, merger of these two positions. So I appreciate your hearing me out, and I'm sorry I was late to the meeting. Well, thanks, thanks for coming, and thanks for participating. Bill. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Is this working? No? Yes? Yes? Is it, I don't know if it's coming out to the room. It can't? Okay, I'll do my best. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, everybody, for your comments. Um, this is a case where we are actually in great agreement on almost everything. Uh, and I think there's some confusion. Um, first of all, the city 100% supports the senior center and agree. I agree with everybody about the value of it. And certainly when I met with you all, I heard loud and clear uh, about the need for it. Um, you know, I think there was some confusion about what happened between then and now. Um, when there was a change in the director, we saw the same things that you all saw, the drop-in membership, uh, partly due to COVID, partly due to the loss of the pool. Uh, the Beals program had changed, costs were getting out of whack, and so we decided that we would take a, a chance to assess the situation to get a better understanding of what was needed and what skills and talents would be needed for the, the next person to come in. And that's what we've been doing. We've had folks engaged in that process, and I think we found a way to, to speed that up. Um, the budget is fully funded in this budget. In fact, later this meeting, the city council is going to be considering a recommendation from staff to cut $1.5 million from our current budget. And none of that is coming from the senior center. It's, so the senior center budget is the same. The position is fully budgeted. So th this, th there was never an intent or, or the action to cut the senior center budget at any time. What we were trying to do is to figure out 
with you how to best provide the services. As you know, we then had the flood. The city is in a bad financial position, so we put on a hiring freeze. That is why the initial call for uh, you know, instructors came out from Arnie, because he's the acting director at this point in time. Now, what we are considering doing is moving forward with a plan that we've had for a long time, pr way ahead of this. Um, someone mentioned community services. There was an active, facilitated process. There's a report that came out of it talking about merging parks, recreation, and seniors into one community services department. And at the time, we had Jeff Beyer, we had Janet Clare, we had Arnie, and we said, this doesn't make any sense. They're experienced directors. We're not going to put one over the other. So the plan was, over time, we will look to have one director and three program directors that are running those services, that are dedicated to those services. We're not taking anything away from anybody. In fact, the, what you all described as the skills and needs of the person that you want to hire is what we are seeking to hire. We've been working on the job description with people. Um, you know, the, the program had great success, and it didn't succeed because Jana was a department head. It exceeded because there was great staff there and great people doing their things. And um, the same support would have come from the city, the council, I believe, the manager, regardless of whose position. We have a, we have a very, uh, I don't want to say loose isn't the right word. We have a very informal type of organization. We don't spend, pay a lot of attention to people's titles. If someone represents a, a program and they come into our office to talk about it, they get the same respect and treatment regardless of their title. So at the end of the day, we've got the same budget. We're moving forward, despite a hiring freeze, to hire the dedicated position to run the senior center. We're not cutting the senior's budget. The only area that we disagree is what we're calling this position. And that is true. Yes, it is. No. Well, OK, well, I, I respectfully disagree with that. Our, our intent is for the person to be the main person running the senior center under the direct supervision of, instead of the assistant city manager, the recreation director. And that is with the idea that it will be um, moving toward the community services. So that's our plan. We're not taking, you know, I, I, people can disagree. We've been engaged with folks at the senior center about the job description and what the needs are based on what our assessment is. We want to hire a person who is fully committed to making the senior center a success, that that's their one and only position, that they're not being tied with other things, that they will oversee what's happening, they'll be involved with fundraising, they just won't have to come to city council meetings and department head meetings because they'll uh, save Arnie for that. Um, we actually feel that this will allow them to focus better on the needs instead of having to do other things. I, reasonable people can disagree with that, but I want to emphasize that's the plan that we've developed, that's what we've tried to communicate. There is no budget cut, there is no position reduction, and as I said, we're recommending some major cuts later tonight, and none of them are in the senior center. Thanks, Bill. Um, Bill, I think all of us on the council got this document that's titled Proposal from the Membership of the Montpelier Senior Activity Center to City Council, dated 10-19-23. And at the bottom, there's a request for two things. One, there's a statement from the council for two things. One. We support the city's plan to post a position for a full-time senior center director by November 1st and to hire a candidate by the end of December. And two, request that the fiscal 25 city budget maintain funding for a strong full-time MSAC director. Is there anything that you don't agree with on, the, on those two items? I mean. We're already starting the hiring process. It's scheduled to be posted November 1st and with the goal of finished by the end of the year. We are about to start our budget process. Our assumption is that this position will be in the budget. Obviously, we have to make budget decisions, but presumably that would be in there. I don't see us recommending not having it in. I think the only difference is whether they are called the executive center. Uh, you know, I mean, the fact of the matter is we could call it the executive director of the senior center and still put them under the rec director. And it's going to be the same exact outcome. 
So I, it's really about the job title. Anything else, Ray? So could you just describe a little more, so what does the rec director, community services department director, what role do they have? Um, like one concern I was seeing in um, some correspondence with folks is like making sure that the director or executive director, or whatever the title is, is able to, you know, come in with a vision, put together a budget to match that vision, you know, just like is, in, is truly like running it and ideally coming in and, you know, creating the vibrant center that I think we all want, you know, for the community. So just like how, what's the role that, you know, right now Arnie would have and like how does that interplay and like what, I do you see any distinction there, or no, do you think like they would have that ability? They would have that ability. And okay. just keep going. So, so like, is this is the parks department going to be similarly? Or at some point, at, at, I mean, right? Now, you know, I think this is. We had a, a situation where the senior center director left. It was a confluence of a bunch of things. The senior center director left, and there were some issues with membership, and as people have mentioned, and we wanted to be able to look into what happened. Then we had the flood, um, and we had already had this plan in place. So I think the goal at some point in the future, and this has already been many years in the work, so it's not something we're doing overnight, is that there would be one position called community services director, and there would be a parks director or whatever, senior center director, rec director, that would, you know, people, division managers, basically, under one community services director, rather than having three department heads. You'd have one with people that are actually doing programming and dedicated to those prospects. There's only one person sort of managing the budgets and the administrative staff and those kinds of things. That was the goal set out in the community services study um, based on, you know, several years ago. And we've been saying, okay, and, and what has happened already is now some of, you know, there used to be three very specific operations, and now some of their admin functions, their, uh, you know, registration for programs, those kind of things have all been merged. Some of their communications and marketing, those are all being done jointly. So we've started to put together the functionings of department while still trying to keep the independent identities of the areas, places. So this is a long-term goal to keep every program just as vibrant as they are now but not, you know, have people focused on what they're supposed to be doing and not having too much overhead. So that's all helpful to hear. I really appreciate the impressive showing tonight of everyone. Thank you for coming out. Um, I mean, I guess my perspective is, I mean, I very much support, uh, you know, whatever the title is, a director position that is given that ability to be visionary, be involved in budget setting, um, you know, I'm a little unclear, it, it, you know, I know Arnie already has a very full plate, so how this actually works with, with his role, so just making sure, I mean, it sounds like the budget and stuff are the same as what the previous executive director had, which is um, great to hear, so I think just my perspective is, you know, just making sure that the position is set up, that it can do what, I, what we're hearing from the community, and that it's set up for success, and that it's not going to be kind of structured in a way that is going to make it harder to build the program up over time, we which want, I th want, think is what we, we all want. The exact same thing that everyone here wants, is a successful, vibrant senior center. Uh, yes, thank you all for coming. And I just want you to know, uh, I'm in my 10th year in the city council, and I've constantly seen an improved attitude and support for the senior center. When I first came, it was about making sure the senior center was getting money from all the towns and, and equally, you know, and I feel like you gain more support. And I was here doing the community service study, and it's a wonderful study. And the idea of it, I mean, I would sit into some of these meetings and realize the rec department, the parks department, the senior center, even the Parks Commission, they needed someone to help them with social media and get more word out. They needed help with having people apply for classes in one place instead of all the different places. So the overarching community service report really needs to be redistributed because it was a community study. It was had a lot of participation of the public, and it was really looking forward. But, but Bill's right. We had three very strong directors. 
And they co-worked and sort of acted as community. Dan Grover came in and we started doing outreach and donations. I mean, both uh, the donations and the media needed more attention than any one department could do. So I really wish that you would realize you are being supported, you are valued, uh, and I certainly want that place there when I'm ready to retire. So uh, please feel appreciated and that we do listen and hope that you'll keep coming and I hope you'll read that report. I believe it's online, but you know, we'll keep the conversation going and make sure that it happens. What we're talking about is where we're moving. So thank you, thank you all. Anyone else on the council? Bella. So thank you everyone explaining your feelings about um, Senior Center. I moved uh, Montpelier in 2017 and first year I couldn't find a job and I didn't know anyone because I came from Turkey, like really far away from here. Then only one um, unit helped me to stay sane. It was a senior center. Although my age was not to be a member, I attended most of the classes and it made me leave my home, meet with people, do things. I wouldn't survive without attending all this. So I understand, as you mentioned, Senior Center and its program, because it is not only for seniors, it opens all community, all ages, like uh, adults, I mean. So it is important and it is very good to hear that budget will be the same, the plans are really parallel, and, and I hope we can clear all the differences and we can be on the same page and thank you all of you for coming here. I think that's the most crowded uh, meeting I have ever uh, been like at the city council. So thank you again. I, I do want to add one thing too, because I really do want to thank the folks for coming. And you know, your feedback at those meetings really was important. And did, did, we did amend our thinking as a result of that. And it did make a difference. And you notice we did get our offices out of there as quickly as we can and we're trying to get the last one out so we, we heard you and we do appreciate that but we, we're really trying to we, we we want the exact same thing that you want and um we're trying to get there um i just wanted to say that um well i i'm <laughs> this is more people than we had to talk about uh Water lines. Uh, I'm amazed. Um, but I, I mean, I'm a, I'm a supporter of, of the senior center. I met a lot of you um, while I was campaigning for this office and um, got to know a little bit about how important it is to the community. Um, I must say I wasn't surprised when I, I, I didn't know the director really of the senior center, but I wasn't surprised at the resignation, I don't know why she resigned, but when I looked at the job description, it, it's, it was an overwhelming job. And I think, I, I think this new arrangement is designed in part to provide more time for what the senior center needs and, and let the director of community services handle um, some of the more administrative, the sort of mundane stuff, um, anything to get that kind of stuff off off the plate of someone who can uh, who really understands the needs of the of the senior uh, the senior center, I think um, is something we should be moving toward. So, I I, I think this I haven't seen the the, the new job descriptions, but um, if they if they accomplish that, I think it's um, it's it's designed to secure the future of the of the senior center, and I'm in support of that. I just didn't want us to miss Nolan's suggestion. And I think uh, that was a wonderful outreach of reaching out to people uh, from another way or other organizations that can have an advantage of meeting with you, having some program interaction. I think that's a really wonderful idea. All right, are we set? Tim. Just one overarching question for Bill, because I keep learning here. So this concept of having program directors and then an agency head? Um, is, that, is that, 
how do you envision it citywide? So we're going to have another layer of people like city manager, assistant city manager, agency heads, and then program I mean, coordinators? Kind of, you know, many of our departments run, like we have a department, we have the Department of Public Works. And then there's, you know, head of water and sewer, head of the plant. So, you know, there's one overarching director and then, you know, police chief and then there's different shift commanders. I mean, this is very, so essentially instead of having department head positions, it's parks, rec, seniors, there'd be a, a single department head and a rec division manager or a parks division manager. And it'd be very parallel to the rest of the structure in the city. Public works, but public safety? Well, I mean, we got, I'm just curious for the big picture. Yeah, well, I mean, we, you know, the, the public, both the police and fire department have, you know, considerably larger staffs than even if we combined all the, the community services people. So, I mean, they're kind of a different scale and public works is double that uh, on, on top of that. So, but I mean, I'm just saying that that is, that is the structure that we have throughout city government and it's designed to allow, what we're really trying to do is get more people to do the direct work that that needs to be done and less people sort of being department heads. Not that there's anything wrong with department heads, but you know, I, we want to be more efficient so that we have people using, doing the services and providing the needs that exactly what these folks are talking about. Thanks. Okay, thank you. And thank you every, everyone for coming out. Um, we'll move to the next agenda item, but, uh, and of course, Everyone is free to stay because this is a public <laughs> meeting. But I suspect that there may be people in the room who have other things to do. And the next item on the agenda is the rec center report. So maybe as people are filing out, if they do file out, we can uh, get that set up to go. If you're not staying for the rest of the meeting, I'd like you to move on out to the hallway so that we can uh, continue. Um, hi, Richard. All right, so the next item on the agenda is the report on the recreation center. and. So I can tee this up while Tom's walking to the mic. <laughs> uh, some of you may recall that a while back we had uh, commissioned a study on um, homelessness and the needs in the community. One of the suggestions was that we look potentially look at the rec center as a place either as a shelter and or a uh, navigation center, or, you know, community hub, or those kinds of things. And um, there were a lot of questions about what the actual condition of the, the rec center was and what it needs. Uh, and there were a lot of opinions offered about what could and couldn't be done quickly 
to, to make that adjustment. So the council, I think, wisely directed us to um, get the actual information. So we uh, put out our proposals. We hired GBA architects. Tom Bachman is here to do a study for us on the structural integrity of the building, the systems, and what it might take to make some conversions uh, to, to either multiple uses or different uses. And, uh, and I will say that the report that was initially uh, in your packet was the one for the next meeting, but we do have the correct one in now. If uh, for some reason you had the, uh, that was changed, I think yesterday or today. Um, but I also think we had sent this out to you earlier. So Tom Bachman's here to walk you through the, um, the report ab about the building. Obviously, you can ask any questions. We have some thoughts about maybe where we might go in the future, but we're also interested in what you have to say. So with that, I'll turn it over to Tom. Thank you, Bill. Have, uh, have people seen the report? Yes. Okay. I'm just going to give like a, a five-minute overview and then just open it up. You can ask me uh, any questions you want. Um, so we were asked by the city in... Hey, you know, Start by telling people who you are. Oh, I thought Bill did that. <laughs> I'm Tom Bachman, Gosselin's Bachman Architects. We're located here in town. So we were asked by the city in June to evaluate the building, to just go through it and see what condition it's in and does it have use, is it salvageable? So we hired um, Engineering Ventures, who did a structural analysis. And when I say analysis, that's that's probably a, a bigger word than I should use. They walked through the building, they studied the drawings, they determined that the structure is decent. We also worked with uh, Slate Engineering out of Northfield. They did a mechanical analysis, and then also uh, Du Bois and King did an electrical analysis of the building. And then we also looked at all of the um, architectural components. So I'm just going to go through the reports very briefly. Um, structural, uh, the building is in good shape. I mean, it's, it's got some issues. Any building that age is going to have issues, but uh, the, roof lo the roof framing, the floor framing is all exactly what you expect. The foundations are very significant. It does have some cracking in the buildings, but that's not unusual for a building of that age. The steps out front are in tough shape, but those can be rebuilt. Um, if whatever the future use of this building was to include a solar system, the roof structure would have to be reinforced to carry that load. Uh, we also did look, just for the fun of it, could this building, could we add a floor to this? You know, the idea of keeping downtown as dense as we could. Structural engineer cautioned us against that. He said there's no reinforcing in the foundations or in the walls, and it would be just a major structural undertaking to do that. Um, the structural repairs to the building, and that would be the same no matter what you do with the building, are estimated right now in today's dollars at $265,000. Uh, mechanical systems are considered fair to poor. I mean, the, it's a, a very old system. The boiler's failing. A lot of the radiators aren't working. The plumbing, is, the, the plumbing lines are old. None of the uh, bathroom fixtures are ADA compliant. So there's not much salvage in the... Uh, in the mechanical systems. What we ask our mechanical engineer, could you tell us, at that point we were talking about the possibility, possibility of a, a facility for the unhoused in there. So what's the minimum we need to do to make that facility uh, work for that? He had given us an estimate of $325,000 was on the low end. That would be just getting this building up and running and kind of more than band-aided together, but in decent shape and it would be about $550,000 to do a complete uh, mechanical rehab of the building. And depending on the long-term use of the building, we would certainly recommend that the mechanical systems be uh, updated. Tom, that's HVAC and plumbing? Yes, okay. yes. Uh, electrical, uh, it's, there, there's not much salvage there. The systems are 40 to 50 years old. It's old uh, fluorescent technology. There's no LED lighting. Outlets are not grounded, the wiring is old, so there's very little salvage in the electrical. But again, we asked the electrical engineer, what's the minimum we could do to, to turn this into a potential short-term facility for the unhoused? Their estimate was $140,000 just to get the building, you know, it's, it's safe and functioning 
to a complete replacement of $565,000. So those are the kind of numbers we're looking at for um, you know, the, the, the systems renovation. We then, um, we didn't have a, a, a real program, but we just wanted to prove that we think the building is salvageable, we think the building is significant. So we looked at three different concepts of how this building might be used from minimal to uh, pretty extreme. So the first concept we looked at and it is could we make public bathrooms in that lower level where the bathroom, where the uh, shower room currently is, and we believe you can. Uh, it's interesting, there's only, it, it, it looks like you would need a very steep ramp to get down to that lower level, but there's only, I think, it's less than two feet elevation from the sidewalk to the slab in the basement. So we're talking about a ramp uh, that would be 20 feet long or so. And if you looked at, if, if you've seen the, uh, the concept we had in there, the ramp came along the front of the building, entered on the right of the stairs. Um, you know, the ramp would be sloping down, so there'd be drainage that has to be dealt with, but that's not a, not a uh, difficult thing to do. So uh, we could put two bathrooms in the lower level. Uh, these could be for the unhoused, they could be for uh, general public use, however we want to use that. We did show in the this quick schematic showers in there, so that might be a, a nice thing uh, to help people. Um, we estimated that concept, and if we did this concept, we're not dealing with the rest of the building. We're not dealing with all the electrical problems. We're just putting bathrooms in there, renovating that area, and the estimate for that was around $650,000. And again, that's in today's dollars. I don't have a solution for how that would be monitored. You know, the possibility of 24-hour bathrooms raises a lot of questions on, on how, that is, uh, how, how, how that is monitored and uh, used. So let's just throw that out there. The next concept we looked at was what if there is a dual use of that building? And by dual use, the rec department would stay in there, but during the cold winter months, maybe, I don't know if it's year round, we could turn the gymnasium into a uh, facility for the unhoused. We think it would sleep about 24 people. Now there's a lot of logistics with that in that if the rec department's still operating there, all the um, beds and screens and things like that need to be moved onto the stage every day. So it's, you know, there's a lot of work involved with that, but we did, uh, we, we believe there could be a dual facility there. I think there'd have to be a lot of um, monitoring to make sure that uh, the population wasn't uh, uh, interacting when we had kids in there, that sort of thing. Now, with that facility, we would have to sprinkle the building. When we have people sleeping in the building, it needs to be sprinkled. We would want it to be accessible, would have to be accessible. So we are proposing an elevator that would, or, I shouldn't say we're proposing, but this scheme does provide an elevator that serves all three floors. And if this were a temporary use, the elevator would be positioned so that if the building became something else, it could serve the rest of that building. So what we would be doing in this scheme is adding an elevator, again, ramping from the front down into, the, at, down into uh, at grade. The elevator then would serve all floors. The left side, if you walk into the building, the right side is uh, Arnie's office and you know, dealing with the rec department. The left side, we would, we would use that for two public bathrooms to support the, uh, the use of a, a shelter there. There'd be an office and a check-in area. So what we did with this scheme is try to really keep the um, changes to the building minor. So that I, the, the, I shouldn't say they're minor, but we're renovating just the left side of the building. We would then open up on the second floor. Uh, there, I, there had been a window there that looked over the gym. That would be reopened so that uh, if it were a shelter, there could be monitoring. You could see what's going on there. So that scheme, and that, that again is not completely renovating all the mechanical systems and electrical systems, but it's the next step uh, to the point where we could then have a functioning mechanical and electrical system in that. And okay, that's concept number two. That's concept number two, and we call it the dual use facility. Mm -hmm. 
Our budget for that is just slightly over $2 million. And then we looked at a third concept. You know, just what happens if the city says, we're done with this building, and they give it to a developer or they sell it to a developer, whatever. What could you do with that building? So we just looked at, uh, obviously there's a real need for housing in Montpelier. So we did look at a scenario that we would take that gymnasium, add another floor in the gymnasium, so take the double height space, turn that into two levels. The basement is very interesting, not very interesting, but it's good. It did not flood and it did not take on water in July. So the basement is, it's good space. It's got good windows down there. They're, they're blocked up now. But if we were to do that, where we add the floor in the gymnasium, we could add eight units of housing per floor for a total of 24 units to that building. Now, they're not big units. Uh, we were looking at possibly transitional housing or worker, worker force housing. They're about 500 square feet each, but they're self-contained. They would have you know, kitchen, bathroom, kind of a sleeping living area. Now, if a developer said that's not what I want to do, you could make these buildings use or larger and go from 24 units to 18 units or whatever you want to do. There's also a scenario where this could be some sort of a, um, uh, I don't want to say communal living, but we're, we're looking at a very similar project with Dewey Hall right now with the uh, Greenway Institute where we're taking Dewey Hall and that is self-contained sleeping units, some with bathrooms, some without, but then you share a community kitchen, you share community space. So that might be another option for the building. So with that, and this is, th these are numbers are very rough, but if that building were turned over to developer and they did this thing top to bottom, make it a net zero building, we're estimating that is slightly, in today's dollars, about $9 million. And that's just, that's based on square foot cost. We've not, none of the engineers have gone into enough depth to say this is what the system is, anything like that. Um, we did talk to Meredith at the city. All three of these uh, issues really, are, there are no big zoning hurdles. Uh, the existing building, I mean the existing use with adding the bathrooms would be considered a community building, which it is now. And the other two uses are permitted in this district. So there's no issue with that. We did a very quick uh, code research of the three scenarios. And as long as the building's sprinkled, as long as we provide two means of egress, out of that building, front and back, uh, in a rated stairway, we have a lot of flexibility at that building. So we do not see any uh, big code hurdles with this building either. And that's kind of my uh, five minute overview of, of the report, but it's all in here. Um, so be glad to ask or uh, answer any questions you might have. Well, thanks, Tom. I was very pleased to see this at We've heard, we've heard some very dire and drastic characterizations of this building, and uh, I'm, I'm very glad to hear it's not as bad as uh, people have been saying it is. Um, it, 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 it does suffer from neglect. I mean, it, it's, yeah. there's a lot of deferred maintenance in there. There's a lot of asbestos and lead that has to be dealt with, but any building this age, and we do a lot of renovations like this, this is, there's nothing unusual with this building. And the bones are good. As I say, the structure's good. It just, it just needs some attention. The systems haven't been updated for decades, but it is, a, uh, in our mind, a good, solid, salvageable building. The downside, I think, probably is parking, but you know, it's, it's, a, it's an urban site, and you have to expect that there's gonna be some issues dealing with site, with parking in a situation like this. Probably needs a room, you said. Uh, I think Chris Lumber indicated that the gymnasium roof was done in 2011, and the front portion is about 20 years old, has been leaking. They've done some maintenance on it. So the front part of the building definitely, I mean, 20 years, 20 to 25 years is average for a, a roof. And I think at the same time, if, if, if the city decided they wanted to to stabilize the building, put a roof on the front, the time Th that would be also the time to really upgrade the insulation on the roof. Mm -hmm. So I think it'd be really good to do a, um, once the city decides what the approach is, to really kind of think this through so that we're not doing anything that has to be undone during the next phase. Yeah, was there, I don't, you know, I didn't read, I read this kind of quickly. Was mm -hmm. there, uh, was there evaluation of the, uh, 
insulation of, of, uh, of the building? There's almost no insulation. And that's going to be, it's, it's going to be a hurdle with the Division of Historic Preservation because they view the outside of the building important. They view the glazed brick in the gymnasium as important. But something has to give because in uh, 2023, not having insulated walls in a masonry building, it just, it's unattainable. So I think we'd have to, there'd have to be some negotiations with that. We had done a study 10 or 15 years ago and they were very reluctant to let us put on insulation on the outside of the building. But I think it's a different time now and uh, there's a lot more negotiating that's happening. Um, who wants to start? I bet there's a bunch of questions. So, uh, yeah. Uh, thanks, Tom. Um, I'm wondering if the uh, the structural stuff that needs to be done, you know, the brick work and, and on the stairs and in the back corner mm -hmm. and the roof, mm -hmm. um, and. I don't think the heating system is in great shape either. Did you ever break out, uh, if we were to give attention to that immediately so it doesn't get worse, what that, what the, co what the cost of that might yeah. be? It's probably in here somewhere. Yeah, if you look at, excuse me, each of the three engineers' reports, okay. they give you est almost, I wouldn't say it, not, by no means detailed, but every component they've got in there listed. It's all, they, yeah. they, break, they break it up. Right. Okay. And actually, one thing I forgot to mention on the structural, one other thing that uh, needs to be done, the building needs to be repointed. But again, that's nothing unusual with the building this age. Right, I remember reading that. Um, the, the estimates on the uh, HVAC stuff, is it, um, is, is any part of it uh, all electric or? They assumed this, they, uh, uh, David Slade assumed that we would be upgrading insulation mm -hmm. in order to support air source heat pumps. Okay. And that would provide air conditioning for the building too. And windows and all that, I mean there are windows that are, do we know what's behind the plywood? We those? don't, but okay. I would suspect, you know, we did 58 Berry Street, the senior center across the way. Those windows were same, deal, same vintage. <laughs> um, so I suspect that what we find behind that plywood would mean new windows. And in our total renovation, uh, let's assume a developer takes the building over. Splitting the th There's enough space. money in there for, uh, for we're assuming it would be a new windows. A double set of windows. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. Uh, more will come up. But, uh, <laughs> that's good for now. All right. Oh, I thought you were raising your hand. <laughs> um, yeah, Donna. Well, I, I really appreciate the layout. I mean, I actually did read it. I didn't necessarily always understand all the diagrams, mm -hmm. but then you did the three concepts, and that really helped me. Um, Good. And looking at these numbers, even the housing, when we looked at this other study, just to upgrade it, mm -hmm. it was around six million, and that wasn't this much housing. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's very helpful to have. Yeah. And those the, the housing numbers are what we are seeing today yes. for new construction. Blink of an eye, it changes, ideas. but... Yeah. Yeah. I think that there could be some combination. For example, you could do public restrooms, and then you could do housing, right? And still have that entrance from the outside to two yeah. public rooms. Definitely. I mean, our... our goal with the three concepts was just to get the conversation going, sure. to show that the building's viable. There could be 10 different of iterations of that. Yeah. Uh, it, can I just finish one thing before I forget? Uh, between now and whatever we did with it in a major way, is there any way to make it accessible with a lift or something? I know there's a back door at the stage. I think it's also where some of the brickwork is cracking. Mm -hmm. Is it is it conceivable that you could do that, or do you, you need to sort of go whole yeah. hog with an elevator right from square? We didn't really look at that. I mean, yeah. we, we assumed that the elevator, at, that, at some point, the building is yeah. is going to be renovated. So yeah. we did not look at sort of a short gap okay. uh, solution with that. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that that couldn't happen. We, we just didn't try to locate a uh, Yeah, even a on list. a temporary, I'm just thinking in, as a temporary yeah. fix. Um, okay, thanks. Sorry. Okay. Thanks. 
Yeah, thanks. Um, I guess not so much a question, just kind of follow up on, on what you were asking about, Sal, and, and what you said that we could kind of mix and match and do different combinations <laughs> of things. Because as I look at this, I think, um, you know, we have this, this great need for the public bathrooms that this could meet right away. Mm -hmm. And we also have a great need for additional shelter housing. Um, seems like those two could fit together as well as allow the recreation department to continue using it during the day. Like we could, we could have all of that mm -hmm. theoretically uh, if we want. I don't know if we want to do that or not, but that's just when I, it looks very appealing to me mm -hmm. when I look at that. And I, I really appreciate the way you laid it out so clearly and the different options. And I'm, I'm really excited and optimistic about what we might be able to do with this building now. So thank you very much. I wanted to wait till everyone else get done, but that was a perfect tee up to where I was going to say. So uh, I'll give you some good news. Um, we are, we, and by we, I mean Chris Lumbra, has been working with Efficiency Vermont, and we are um, pretty much teed up for a grant um, of about 1.5 million, which would be with a 300,000 match from the city, which could do all the, which could do all of the HVAC and electrical upgrades. Uh, and possibly the bathroom upgrades. We have got to figure out exactly what it includes. We have $1.8 million total, so we would be able to get that all done with primarily grant funds and to get the energy efficiency to where it needs to be. So that, um, we really wanted to have this conversation first before we brought it to you. Uh, even in our budget rescission, our team opted to leave enough money for that match, even though we're making other discussions because we realized it was so important. The other concept that we wanted to throw out, and I, I just emailed Tom about it today, and of course, he gave us all kinds of great options, and then you think of more afterwards. But um, our staff suggested following up on what Council Member Brown said is, could we look at the, the basement area, which is pretty large and has windows, if we were to do that ramped entrance in the bathrooms, to convert that into um, the shelter and navigation space, keeping the rec center on the first floor or the upper floor as it is now until we decide what we want to do with rec center and then potentially have the two floors of housing, maybe transitional housing there in the future with the, you know, to help the folks in the shelter move up to transitional housing to move out um, so that it would be, you know, kind of a, that would be a, a future vision or not, or maybe it gets converted to housing, but that we would be able to have, get the building upgraded a lot of the systems have used the basement space more efficiently than what it's being used for right now, meeting a very urgent need, and that could probably be a permanent year-round shelter. And if we were to do that, I suspect, and I have no, no um, knowledge officially of this, I suspect that the state would participate in upgrading and re putting what in is needed to that space if they thought it was going to be a permanent long-term shelter as opposed to you know, a one winter only kind of thing. So we would probably get funding for that as well. So we would have the bathroom space, we'd have the, the utilities done, we'd have the basement converted to a shelter area, and then the gym and everything upstairs would stay as is until we make future decisions about rec. So, but we wanted to throw that out and see if there was any thought you know, if people liked or didn't like that, or, you know, there's a lot of other things we could do with this building, including 24 units of housing, which we need, desperately need, so. Just, just one quick question. I mean, that all sounds really exciting and great. Do you have a sense of how many um, people could sleep if we did the lower level? The, the, the lower level, I mean, we don't because we haven't done we do the study, but time. based on the size of the upstairs, I mean, it's the same footprint, mm -hmm. more or less, it's I mean, with the footprint. exception of the, you know, but the, the boilers where the offices are and that kind of thing. So, I mean, it would probably be similar. Um, I, that, I think it would, I think it would just be a matter of working with Good Samaritan Haven or somebody who knows more about this than I do. do what, what's, the, what's the right number for a, a facility like this that they can manage and uh, does it get out of control? And of course, one of the things we always hear when we're talking about shelter is that the physical space is one part of it, but staffing and services is equally important. Yeah. Um, Sal and then Donna. I was just thinking in connection with the shelter space in the basement, I remember when, um, when we were looking through the building, Rick, I think you mentioned 
monitoring the gym. It would have been it was easy because you could you could be up have someone um, staff on the second floor looking down. The basement's a different situation. I think those two long walls are structural. Are they or? It, it, it looks like there are columns in there. So I think most of those walls could come down. And if okay. I, I think the only way, I mean, Rick, correct me if you're wrong, but I think the only way for a, a decent operating shelter is to have a big, big space like that. It just doesn't work to have uh, separate rooms where you can't monitor what's going yeah. on. Still, it's a pretty big space taken yeah. Yeah. all together. Yeah. So it sounds like an interesting option. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but the basement is the one that had the rifle range. Yeah. Uh, so it has the most investments, right? Yeah. So you yeah. have to do that right away. Yeah. We have to, yeah. we have to yeah. mitigate all that. Yeah. As I said, I don't think there's any. Yeah. I don't think there's any more contaminants in this building than you would expect to see in a building this age. I mean, you know, the, the firing range has got lead, but that's that's. That we, we, Almost every building we work with has some abatement in it, so it's just not a uh, showstopper. So there's enough material in here to pull out that idea, or do we have to add some more time to your contract? I think we, uh, you know, I suspect we need to, first of all, we need to make sure that the state, Good Sam, and other people are actually interested in this proposal. Um, so that would be a start, and then figure out what is needed um, so I'm, I'm not in a position to make any kind of statement yet, but I, probably we would need further review, at least of that basement, just right. to make sure we know what codes are needed down there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we'd have two different uses in a building, so I think those have, have something. So I couldn't, I can't say for sure, but I suspect we'd need a little bit of review there, and it could be that the state or somebody partners in that because it would be for those purposes. It feels absolutely right. When you have mixed use in a building like that, and especially with people sleeping in there, the Division of Fire Safety is going to look so closely at how that is separated from everything else. So, but it, it's it's all doable, I think. Just curious, do we have any sense of you know knowing there's a lot of pieces to line up, but like how quickly could we move on this and actually be offering shelter services as a first step? At, you know, as we looked at transitional housing or other housing options for a longer term project? I, I don't know the answer to that. I think we could, assuming we get a grant for the building systems, that could be done, you know, in a few months. We could get that work started. Um, you know, I'm, I'm looking to Rick, but he didn't come here prepared to answer that question. My guess is we would have, first of all, we're, we're, we're already providing a shelter at the Elks Club this winter. So that's got to be the focus for service. I'm, susp I'm guessing that we would need to get, figure out the funding. We'd need to do the review of what needs to happen, design that, bid it. So, you know, maybe by, I mean, optimistically by next winter, if all went well, but I think that would be optimistic, um, you know, if everything lined up. But I, I don't know for sure. I, I, I think there is a desire from providers and the community uh, the folks dealing with the unhoused community and the state uh, to have a sort of a longer term shelter area in Montpelier, not want, you know, not bouncing around from church basement to Elks Club to here and there. Like this is a place it, and particularly one with bathrooms and showers and that kind of thing. So it's possible, but we haven't had this conversation with anybody. So this is our idea and we wanted to make sure we ran it by you before we did anything else. So if agreement that we wanted you to move towards the basement uh, as a shelter with the idea of going in the next step to upper housing, then you could go off and do that without spending any money? Uh, we could find out the next steps. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And ideally, we'd find someone else to spend yes, the, yes, the money. Yes. But if we can't, you know, we may, it may be that we have to chip in for the, at least the study of what has to happen. I, you know, I don't know. I can't promise that. Grants that you mentioned, though, we have at least this, and if we go on to the next step that we're presenting, then with, that we're really looking so, at this seriously. So the grant would deal with all the all the systems that Tom talked about, the electrical, uh -huh. HVAC, yes. mechanical, all that kind of thing. So that would be great. Those would all be brought up to modern standard. I don't know if it would deal with insulation. We have Chris isn't here, so I can't ask him that. Um, you know. That's different from renovating the basement area, converting the basement area, doing that ramping, upgrading the bathrooms. 
that's a whole different project really so we'd have to figure out how to make that project happen and who was funding it and what the ultimate uses and purposes were so the you know they're not really the same thing yeah have you, have you had any success with design review boards on solving the the brick on both sides problem Actually, this is the first time we've ever heard that. Oh, and where, where the, you had brick? Yeah, because yeah, that brick on yeah. the inside of the gym. And as I said, this was 10 or 15 years ago. Yeah. We had the brick tested at that point to see how moisture migrated through the brick. Yeah. The front brick was it? The front brick was okay. We could insulate from the inside. The back brick could not be insulated because it, it from the inside uh, because of the way the moisture was uh, migrating through the brick. So the solution was to put on like a... Um, uh, drive it, wrap the building in some sort of drive it insulation, and preservation at that point said no. But again, that was 15 years ago, and it's a different world than it was 15 years ago. And I think you could open up that conversation again. Is the, re is the unreinforced, the fact that the, the brick widths are unreinforced, does that demand that the insulation be on the outside so that the brick can? I guess Dry I to the outside. Yeah. I guess so. Uh, I won't talk to my structure. I can't answer that. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Yeah. 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 Actually, one bad. more thing. I just want to say in favor of the building. It's one of the few buildings that's downtown that didn't flood. So to me, that has a lot of value. Yeah. How close did the water get to it? Not very. No. That's what I thought. But yeah. I didn't even get moisture. Basically. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. 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 Does it help to have a motion? Well, we're or not, just give I don't some. Quite there yet, but that's the, that's exactly what I was going to ask. What are you looking, Bill, for? Like whatever clarity you wish to provide is always helpful. <laughs> uh, uh, I want I want to make sure that other that people in the public who are here or online have a chance to be heard. But because uh, I see a couple of people in the room who probably are interested. Rick, you're one of those people. <laughs> And Dan, you're next. Uh, thank you, Rick DeAngelis. I'm the co-executive director of Good Samaritan Haven. Uh, having a year-round low barrier shelter is our number one priority. And um, you know, we've done these uh, seasonal overflow shelters for the, well, we, we uh, were technical assistance last year, but we've done them over the last six or seven years. It is a really difficult thing to pull together every year. And, uh, and by the way, thank you for approval of the lease for the Elks Club. Um, uh, it's very much needed. So we're very interested in this opportunity. Um, it's a great location. It could be a great space. Um, so we're looking forward to talking with, you know, continuing the conversation with the city staff. The one concern that we have is the dual use aspect. And particularly, particularly if um, young people are in there during the day. Um, it's one thing if you just have people there sleeping at night during the winter and then they're gone. Um, it's another thing, I think, if you have a year-round facility and um, even if people are leaving during the day, they're probably going to be congregating nearby to some degree. And um, so I just think we have to look at that really, really carefully. Um, so, but uh, we're glad to be part of that conversation. And just one note on the funding, um, we met with the Commissioner of Children and Families just a couple of weeks ago. They're the agency that funds all of the homelessness programming. They are desperate for more shelter in the state. And, um, we mentioned this, the possibility of this location. They seem very, very interested. And um, so, uh, Bill, you might want to follow up with them, or we can do it jointly. Uh, they very much encouraged us to put forward any ideas that we had. So thank you. Thanks, Rick. Uh, Dan. How much time do I have? Three. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> that ain't gonna cut it. Oh yeah. I'm ready, Dan. You ready? Okay. Um, well, 
First of all, thank you so much for, for doing this report. Um, I should start by saying I'm Dan Toll. I'm here primarily wearing, wearing my hat as a resident of Montpelier, First Avenue. But of course, um, I'd be remiss and to say that uh, my firm also was the firm, as you all know, that did the homeless housing study earlier this year. And one of our three major recommendations was this housing hub concept. So first of all, thank you so much for doing this project. So my first question for you is, did you and, and the other contractors have an opportunity to read the study that we did? Yes, we did. Okay. Because um, I really love the, this idea of the housing concept, by the way. I think it's you know, the fabulous that, that this is part of the mix. But the one thing I wanted to point out is that in terms of the, op, the concept two, you, know, you talk about you know, a, a overnight shelter, uh, we, the housing we kind of missed at least part of it. And the housing hub concept was a winter overnight shelter to start with, but also having administrative sta space for the service providers to be able to come to the housing hub. So there was that element to it. Just, you know, so you're yeah. speaking to, to Tom, but that was one of the reasons we thought of the basement space being better because then we could have office space in there too to, to meet that housing hub need um, rather than the open gym. Okay, yeah. Unfortunately, as, as you mentioned, I, I didn't even see the report till this afternoon. I went to the website and yesterday and it wasn't there. Unfortunately, Kelly caught it and posted it. So I have not had a chance to read the whole report, but I have been able to skim. Um, the second thing in terms of the cost of the housing, um, when, you, when you did the estimate, was this based on uh, private market construction costs as opposed to uh, downstreet? Because as you're probably aware, downstreet has a lower cost of capital and tax credits. So they can, they can typically do a project like this for significantly less than a private developer. We didn't get into that detail. We carried the price we've seen on recent yeah. big scale affordable housing renovations that we've been involved with. So I don't, I don't know about all the funding. I know Downstreet, yeah. we work with Downstreet all the time. Yeah. So we know what their project costs per right. square foot. Right. So you know it, it, it could be significantly lower than nine million. I don't believe so. You don't believe so? No. Okay. Based on what we're seeing today. Okay. Well. As Donna pointed, yeah. it, the costs keep going up day by day. Yeah. So the sooner that we can address this, <laughs> uh, the sooner we can get a cost that's lower than it will be tomorrow. Um, the last, I guess I'll keep it short, uncharacteristically, but the last question I had, we were talking about the funding issue. How much of the 425000 that was allocated for ho uh, homeless and public bathrooms is left that could be allocated to any of so these concepts. The match came for this grant that I'm, we're I'm having a hard time hearing. I'm sorry, that would be where the $300,000 match came for this grant that we're talking about would be toward this project to do all the renovations in that building. The $300,000 300, match? For the, that $1.5 million grant to do all of the renovations. Okay. But what about the 425? How much is that? Well, left? that's 300 of the 425. 300, okay. I thought you were so, saying that, that was no, the match. No, 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 That is where that match would come from. Okay. Pre pre presumably. Great. Well, I, I concur with Rick's comment about the permanent overnight shelter being a priority going forward. And I love this idea of, I hadn't even, you know, we, my partner and I had thought about long, and I think we talked about, you know, medium to long term thinking about housing, but I'm really delighted to see this as part of a proposal right now. So I'd encourage the council to consider concepts two and three, but in the in terms of the concept two, um, think about the housing hub concept that was in our proposal, our recommendations. Thanks, Dan. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm looking at the, uh, at the Zoom, and I'm not seeing anyone online trying to raise their hands. I'm sure that someone will correct me if I'm missing somebody. But so that get, I think that gets us to the question that Lauren was starting to ask, which is are you, are you looking for a motion saying to go ahead or are you looking for the council members to all say, boy, this seems like a great idea and, and just start investigating or? Yeah, I mean, you, obviously we don't have any funds and we don't have any, we're not asking you to commit anything, I, but to the extent that you wish to go on the record as saying this is a direction, whatever the direction is, 
that you'd like us to pursue to come back with more recommendations or, you know, funding requests or grant funds or whatever. I mean, you know, we, we came up with an idea based on after we saw Tom's report. Obviously, we know and, and we'd heard from Rick that there might be some interest, but we wanted to follow that up. Um, but we, we, you know, we don't want to get out ahead of you and, and recognizing that we're in tough times right now, too. So, um, but it is an important community need. So whatever, whatever, wherever you feel, whatever you want to tell us, we'll, we'll listen. Cool. Lauren, do you want to make your motion? Are you? Sure. Um, so I move that we direct city staff to seek state and federal funding to help support advancing shelter and housing at the rec center site. Second. Any discussion by members of the council? So, um, right now, it, it's the building is still functioning as a recreation center, and we'll need to we'll need to continue functioning that way. So, you know, th this will need to be staged one way or the other. I, I, I assume that people remembered that, but something I've been thinking about, and it could be for a number of years under that situation. Um, so. Carrie, then Donna. Um, can I hear the motion read exactly? <clears throat> we direct city staff to seek state and federal funding to help support advancing shelter and housing at the Red right Center site. Okay, so that sounds good to me. And part of what I like about it is that it gives us room to <laughs> not do that. <laughs> But it's giving the city, it's giving the city manager the go ahead to go ahead and look for money and get started with that. Does that kind of capture what mm -hmm. the intent was? Okay, then I think it sounds great. <laughs> well, just to remind people, my understanding is that basement right now is storage. It's not used for any programs or classes. So that basement could possibly go in advance of anything else we do for rec somewhere else. I just wanted people right. to understand That's what that. We're suggesting. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it's a motion, but obviously, I think like having some that involves like planning and like thinking through the steps that would be needed, which of course you'll do. So just just to state the obvious that part of <laughs> as you seek the, the thing, it's it's knowing of that course. this is the direction we want to seek and that yes. we'll right. look forward to the hearing the updates on what would be needed, right. timelines, all those things to give us this decisions to make in the future. Yes, many, many decisions along the way. That's right. I just sort of want to remind the public that one of the things to look ahead and, and I think our staff is so good about looking for grants is that the state does have money that they're offering people dealing with shelters. So this is the time to really invest and see what is possible. Well, the funds are there. Are we ready for a vote? If so, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? <laughs> all right. Thanks, Tom. I think this is great. I think this is a real opportunity to address a, a terrible need in the city. So thanks for the, the report. Thanks for the vote. All right, we are up to item seven, Richard Shear on communications. Since I'm on the agenda, you don't need your signs. <laughs> uh, might I say? But, but I will point out that we do have a busy agenda and so. I will be brief. Uh, might I say that in my over 20 years living in this city, this is the first time I have ever appeared on a council agenda. I've appeared speaking before council, but this is the first time on the agenda. And when I came in, I was thrilled at all the people who came to hear what I had to say. <laughs> I feel like the opening act at Coachella now. Um, that means that I'm coming on at noon and the concert starts late. Uh, basically, I think it was interesting on the agenda that I was between the senior center and the recreation center because those were both projects that had very long histories. Uh, and in fact, Tim is a good part of that history because he was a school board president 
and these were both with the school board for many years. Bill was involved in this, and in, tangentially I was involved as well. Uh, when you talk about, um, the there was a study of the facility by Don Lorenovich. Uh, I don't know whether that was referenced. It was still in the school archives, but probably not in the city archives. What, I can, what I'm here today to talk about is the website. And again, uh, I'm looking over at John Odom and at Bill because they were part of the transition from the old website to the one that we're in right now, which is the city's new old website. And basically a decade, it's been about a decade since the website's really been addressed. And uh, in a fundamental way, and the website has grown in a sense, it's grown deeper. There's more documents in that website than there ever were before. It's just getting at those documents is nearly impossible. It's, it's, not, it's not indexed to current standards. When I went to look up the rec center and I went to look up the senior center, it was very difficult to find my way through that. Uh, Tom wouldn't have had to ask Chris if our capital budgets were indexed correctly. He would have found out exactly when that roof was replaced because the cap it was in our capital budgets. But our capital budgets are not indexed that way. What I'm here to request of City Council is yet another Citizens Committee. And it's a Citizens Committee that will study the city's website and how the city's website can become more functional and more reflective of the ability to frame municipal discussion in coherent policy terms so it doesn't end up in front page forum with people yelling at each other and trading pseudo faux facts. That's what I'm interested in, is how can our city website become more modern, more accessible, and more policy focused so that people who have an interest in the issues of policy can follow them historically so that we're not constantly pretending that this is new when it's not. And the one particular area I had an interest in was the presentation of the city budget and the discussion of both city budgets, capital and operating, so that people can understand the current city budget, where we, how we got to the current city budget, and how that differs from the proposed budget so that the, the city's presentation of budget isn't a series of show and tells with no one here except for people who want to yell for their own parochial interests. So that people who are interested in the budget can intelligently not only see it online, but ask questions online that are answered so that other people can see what questions have been submitted and answered so that it isn't focused solely on these city council meetings. So I propose yet another limited city committee. I think it should take about five months to really sit for a group of people to explore this and make recommendations as to what a different version of a city website, the functionality, might actually look like. And I think there's skills in this city to tap on, and I think there would be interest in this. And I, if this council were to recommend such a committee, I would put my name in there to work on the budget section. But we wouldn't be, I noticed that Evelyn is sitting in on this. Uh, Evelyn's work in social, or if she's here, uh, Evelyn's work in social media wouldn't be touched. The Facebook page, the Instagram, the mail outs, all of that stuff is really good and really present. But it's not archival, it's the present moment. And the present moment wouldn't be addressed. That would be left to her. But I think that 10 years really is a long time on, on a website as important as a city website. See, I kept it brief for me. Is there any question coming up that you guys have of what I'm proposing? Anyone have any questions before I ask uh, Bill to give us his take on this? You know, I, I, I can tell you, my, 
my question about this is, is kind of fundamental, which is that uh, what you're talking about this committee doing is really what our city government and our paid staff who, uh, who run the web page do and what they're paid to do. And so that's, you know, I question, you know, every, every citizen committee we create requires staffing by, by paid city staff to do it. And so I, I am really questioning, well, what is there that uh, this would do that we're not already doing? And there, obviously, there are always going to be people who think the city is doing some things better or worse than they, uh, they would if they were in charge. But, uh, but, you know, we don't have a committee to tell the public works how to uh, pave roads. We don't have a committee to tell the fire department how to operate. And so why is this different? It's different because our city staff, in terms of web, are not talking about the fundamental concept of how the web is designed, of what the web is designed to do, and how it, they are a maintenance crew that makes sure that our website continues operating uh, and functioning, which is a perfectly valid staff position and staff usage. Every website needs its technical support but realize that that is technical support of an existing system. And it's what we're talking about is the same thing in a sense as what Tom was talking about, which isn't keeping the recreation center in its current technical state. We're talking about pushing that use to a different functional level to address different functional needs. So it isn't duplicative of those people. Those people, if we were to change this website, their job would be the same. It would be to make sure that that website is functioning and that that website is actually updated and things like that. What this is, is it's talking about the use of the city website. And a decade is forever in terms of, of websites. Okay. Um, you know, I, I guess what I, I, I'm, I'm not sure we need a committee, but I certainly think we could take suggestions. I mean, you have some great ideas. We'd love to hear them. Um, you know, we, we have just recently completed an upgrade of the website. And one of the things that Evelyn and, and Mary and my office have been tasked to doing is going through and trying to do the exact things you're talking about, you know, pull the inventories together, fix broken links. Up, upgrade it. Uh, we've added uh, things, you know, the budget, for example, we last year went to new budget software, uh, which is far more user friendly. And we also started the, the budget videos, which we're going to do more of this year. So people can actually listen to those. We've now added the Zen City platform, which does have the interactive piece. So I think our plan for this year's budget is to have places where people can ask questions, offer comments, answer survey questions, those kind of things. So I mean, we're, we're pretty moving pretty actively to trying to accomplish the goals that Richard is saying, and Evelyn's really been leading the way. Um, but certainly, um, I think if folks like Richard or anybody else have really good suggestions, uh, let's have them. You know, I, we want, we agree. But i not sure website by committee, but I, that's really up to you and up to, you know, I don't want to, whatever you think. Oh, any other? Go ahead, Sal. It sounds to me like you're talking about Developing a new taxonomy for for a certain portion of the site, not not the it's not a new technology. It doesn't necessarily have to be a new technology. I've designed websites, no, not even websites, but data work. I mean a new tech taxonomy, a, a way of yeah, a, a new way of of looking at what we have at our archive, massive archive, and how to make that massive archive more accessible. And I think that making a suggestion in an email is dismissive. And, and saying that basically the status quo is the best that we can do. We had a committee on homelessness. Why? Because a group of people felt that the city could do better. Why did we have a committee on parking that I was a member of? Because we felt that the city could do better. Why did we have a committee on energy? because we felt that the city could do better. 
that's what I'm saying. If I could just finish my question. Um, so what sort of access to the website content would you require as a committee that you don't have now just to, I to accomplish this? I think what we would, now if I were, you know, the god of this committee, you know, which I certainly wouldn't be, I would be one of, of, a, of a group of people, but were I structuring this project, I would start with what do we, and I would look at other towns and what they have and look at functionality. What does our website cover? What do their websites cover? What do they, what are the gaps that we might have right now that other cities don't? And I recall my conversation with Bill when we did this. I had one suggestion when we put this in, and that was do a page counter so that we can figure out what pages people are using so that we can figure out where we might want to invest our resources to go more. I don't know whether you remember that conversation, but that was my only suggestion I made when the website you know, was proposed. And what I would like to do is take a look at what other cities are doing to see if there's gaps. Then I would go in and take a look at our core documents that are beneath this and what can be indexed in those documents so that uh, we can do a query against that. So if you're looking for a certain thing, you can find it in zoning, you can find it, you know, so that you can dig into many different areas and get keywords in this to be able to find it. It's not the documents themselves. It's how we choose to query into that for informational purposes. So I'm not talking about necessarily uh, changing the whole website. I'm, I'm talking about changing how we query into this for informational purposes. It's, it's, it's a lot more specific than that. It's being able to narrow in and focus in on information from the past to shape our present knowledge. And, and it's, it's like when you listen to the business about the rec center, we've been talking about that for years. You know, what was that discussion for the years? The senior center as well. What, you know, we're approaching this as if this is new territory. It's not. And if people were able to query in, they'd be able to more intelligently discuss this dispassionately without calling other people's liars or, or other people's shills or whatever. That, that's non-productive. So that's what I'm after. Thank you, Mr. Green. So um, since public um, has a chance to come here and share their ideas with us, uh, how about having a, like an independent work group or work group instead of establishing another committee? Uh, what, what is the really difference uh, of this project needs to be in a committee, but not a work group. You know, you can just work. It, it makes no difference. To me, okay. that's semantic. If it's a yeah. work group, that's fine. If it's a committee, that's fine. That's yeah. semantics. Yeah, I mean, like, we don't have to do anything about it. You can always, uh, you know, organize your own work group and do whatever you want to do and just, like, share the insights with the city and city Could you imagine the frustration of a group of people who put in their time and go to city council, have, having met for months or whatever, and, and I use that, that police, the defund the police people who had that group. They were sanctioned by the city council. They did an excellent report. But could you imagine doing that report and having the city council turn around and saying, well, that's your work. Well, I'll point out that was not a defund the police group. It was a police advisory commission. Uh, Carrie. Yeah, so this is a, the direction that I've been thinking also. Um, that I, I'm not sure. I, so first of all, let me say that I think that your your thoughts about what kind of access to information we want to have on the website are really interesting. And I would love to be able to, to have that kind of historical record that you're talking about, too. Um, I'm not sure that that it's a, such a priority of the, of the city council right now that we would be directing the city to do that and then create a committee to help that happen. But I do think that you, you have some very interesting ideas and could have some really valuable input. 
And I, I think that you might actually get farther with it, I don't know, but by doing it outside of the structure of a city committee. Um, that because we're just you know it's adding more bureaucracy it's uh um you know it's it's not it's not coming from the city council it would be something that could be coming from citizens saying this is what we observed and these are the suggestions that we have uh, there's no more assurance that the recommendations of a committee would be taken than the recommendations of a group of concerned citizens who put in the effort and the Just research for the record. A, a recommendation okay. right, right. right but for the record carrie they had people, the Homeless Task Force got the study. Richard Carey has the floor. I'm sorry, Carey. Um, so, so I would encourage you to pull together people who are like-minded as you are, who want to work on this, and see what you can come up with. And I think you'll get a lot farther. Okay. Um, quick questions on just the, the base where we're really starting all this from, too. Um, Having had my own company with managing websites that people search for data all the time and watching that evolve. And I use the city website frequently researching for real estate information um, daily. And it's it's very, and I also go to sites for every other town around here and do it. So I have a pretty good basis of who's got a great site and whose sites aren't so good. Um, so I guess my questions for us are, um, do we, who hosts our site? Do we have someone that we pay to host our site that keeps it current? I assume we do, yeah. And then? Yes, the Civic Plus is our provider. Is that Civic Plus? They're a major yeah. municipal government website provider nationally. Which is what I was hoping you'd say, because in, in real estate, we go through, there's a great group in Burlington, Vermont, that's like a <laughs> nationally rated company, that does real estate websites. And I assume there had to be an equivalent for municipal websites. Yeah, and those pretty major players. Yeah, and those people know what they're doing and keep it current. Because I have seen a lot of changes over 10 years. It, at least in the research side I'm on, it, it hasn't been stagnant. Um, so I think there's a good basis here that maybe getting that information first before you kind of sure. look to change it. If I'm seeing know what the, the problem that council's not seeing, Tim, then yeah. that's fine. Yeah. But okay. I will remind Jack that the homeless people got to get, the homeless advocates got together and ended up with this study. They weren't told, sit in your own group and come to us. The people who are concerned about police brutality in Montpelier weren't told, hey, talk amongst yourselves. You know, I'm just saying that there are certain groups in this city that are able to sit and access a council concern. So do not be dismissive immediately and say that information access is less important. But I can understand what, everything you're saying. Okay, Rich. Yeah, we've got a member of the public you'd like to speak. I'm Meg Baird, and I've lived in Montpelier since 1979. I don't understand all the procedures, but if Richard formed this group at, in his living room, and he came to the city council, would they have three minutes to speak because it wasn't something that the city council asked to have happen, whereas Tom Bachman, my understanding is the city council asked him to do research, so he got to speak for a bunch of minutes. And as someone who is trying to get factual information to form my opinions, instead of going with the rumors from Trump Porch Forum or asking someone who doesn't really know, I would like to be able to find stuff easily on the web page. I would like to have been able to go to the web page as someone who's not really computer competent and to be able to type in senior center history of it, what's the budget, so that I would have been going with the factual documents in the archive versus someone who's annoyed and may have the facts, but I'm like, do they really have the facts of the history? So I think it's a great idea. I don't understand why people are so, let's not have another committee that the council is asking for. And I think it makes sense for you to have 
a lot of information versus not a lot of information when you're making decisions. I think having excess, an overabundance of information is better when you make decisions versus a minimal one perspective amount of information. Okay, thanks. Um, I'd like to bring this to, uh, to the point, which is that there's a proposal before us to create uh, a committee and uh, along the lines that uh, Richard laid out in his memo. And uh, I'm wondering if there's interest in moving forward on that uh, proposal. Okay. Thank you. Thanks very much for your time. Thanks, Richard, for, for, for bringing this in. And I know that if you wanted to, if you had a list of things that you wanted to get improved, that you could make an appointment and sit down with Bill or sit down with Evelyn and uh, raise them. But, but, but we're going to move on. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. For Donna. putting me on the agenda, done it. Yeah, no, and I appreciate it too. It's just is not where I want to put on another committee because a committee has a, we have a lot of obligations about, and I do think that you directly, as your information with our staff, that a lot can happen. But I also wanted to talk to to Meg, uh, in that I really apologize if. I guess I misinterpreted if the senior center individuals were coming for a presentation versus that they wanted to have a lot of people speak. So a presentation gets a certain amount of time depending on what the chair allows, but then individuals who want to comment about that presentation only get the three minutes. I get that. So, but okay. Johanna, our thought was doing the presentation. Well, see, that's where I, I guess I, I thought she wasn't. Uh, so that I missed that and maybe Jack did too. So I apologize if that's what she was doing. But I think that's the kind yep. of thing, having that information easily accessible. Because now I think there are a certain number of seniors who are irritated with the city council and feeling like, yep. why did they get treated differently at tonight's meeting than it? Other groups get treated. Okay, thank you. I, we obviously had a, uh, spent a, devoted a lot of time on that, but now it's time for our 10 minute break. Um, I see 837, so back here at 847. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Next, Next item, item on the agenda, agenda is item, item nine, nine water, water service, service line, line inventory, inventory process overview. overview. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So to, to our consultant, consultant Patrick Smart, Smart who, who is online, and Kurt Modica is also online. This is one of these projects we're required to do by the state, and we're required to provide you an update. So I don't know, Kurt, if you have any more words you want to offer, if we want to go straight to Mr. Smart. Um, sure. I'll um, just sure. give a brief introduction. Brief introduction. This project is a water line service inventory. So uh, essentially um, inventorying all the service lines within existing buildings within the water system. And uh, this project uh, consultant was selected through an RFQ process previously approved by city council. And uh, we just wanted to provide um, some information to the public and council about the process um, that will be involved, the public outreach that we'll be doing uh, uh, to the water system customers. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Patrick Smart with MSK Engineering. Thanks, Kurt. Great. We can hear you. Thank you. Oh, you can hear me? Hear and see you, yes. Okay, great. Um, Thanks for the introduction. My name is Patrick Smart with MSK Engineers. Uh, as Kurt said, I just wanted we wanted to come tonight to give a brief overview of the service line inventory project and the next steps. Um, like Kurt uh, mentioned, it's a federally required project. The goal is to identify all of the service line materials uh, throughout the city's water system. And to do that, we're gonna be reviewing whatever records are available. And we'll also be reaching out to all of the customers of, uh, of the water system to, uh, solicit them to either take a photo of their service line right next to the distribution meter where it enters their home, 
or also to uh, schedule an appointment and one of uh, MSK's field technicians can stop by to observe the service line materials and record them for the inventory. Uh, one important note as part of this project, we're especially interested in determining whether there are any lead service lines that may be present in the city. And if you know anybody, or if you find that your home do itself does have a service line, a lead service line, please tell me. Uh, currently, there are significant amounts of federal funding that are available to every state, and Vermont is receiving about $28 million a year for the next five years of federal funds that can only be used to identify and replace lead service lines. Uh, that's part of the funding source that we're utilizing for this inventory project. I bring that up because if we do find lead service lines, then the next step is to uh, capitalize on this federal funding that's available to put together a project and hopefully replace those lines at low to no cost to the home and property owners. So uh, that's the long-term piece is uh, there is a plan if we do encounter any service lines that that need to take, uh, we need to take action for. Over the next couple of weeks, we'll be coordinating with uh, Public Works and uh, Evelyn to, We'll also be sending out letters uh, through that coordination to all of the customers of the water system, informing them about the project and giving them options to either click on a hyperlink, uh, email a photo of their service line directly to us, or also to schedule an appointment and uh, we so that we can come by and complete this work. Uh, I really appreciate your time this evening. I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have about the project. Thank you. Thank you. So this is not a sampling uh, survey. You're intending to get uh, information about every single customer in the water system. That's correct. Yes, we're we're looking to get information uh, about every single service line. Is the goal. And and what's the time frame to completion? Right. Uh, the deadline is to have the completed inventory submitted to the state of Vermont by October 16th of 2024. So we have a little less than a year to complete it. Currently, I believe we're on track to uh, produce a draft inventory to share with the city uh, late spring, early summer next year. Anybody? Uh, Lauren? Yeah, just curious. So you said if people think they have lead lines like what would people be looking for or is that if we send the picture would you notify somebody that it looks like a potential lead line I'd... yeah that's a great question so uh lead itself it looks like a dull silvery metal it's really soft you can easily scratch it with a penny those are a couple of quick easy tests you could do if you're looking at a pipe and you're thinking oh i don't know if this is galvanized or or if it's maybe it's lead that would be one way you could tell uh, we also have little swab tests. They look like little paint brushes. And you may be familiar if you've ever tested your home to see if you have lead paint in your home, it's the same exact test. You can swab it on the surface of a pipe. And if the pipe is lead, the swab will turn red. It even rhymes. Um, but that's another method that you could use. I would say if you're a resident or a homeowner, if you're looking at a pipe and you're concerned or you're uncertain, uh, just reach out, either email or call me, and I'll be happy to come over and, and have a look at it and tell you what the materials are and what next steps you, you could take or would be appropriate. Um, I think I, I've lived here 40 years. I don't, I'm not aware that this has ever been done. Has this been done in Montpelier before? Um. I don't believe so. This is the first, it, EPA passed new federal regulations in 2021 called the Lead and Copper Rule Revisions. And these are the first sets of drinking water regulations that have ever formally required a public utility to go through and actually inventory their service line materials. Uh, in previous years, um, I believe the Lead and Copper Rule was established around 1994. At that time, there was a requirement for utilities to 
identify the presence of lead service lines, but that was only limited to if they knew they had any, they had to self-report and say that. There wasn't a requirement to comprehensively review records or, or develop an inventory uh, in the fashion that's being required now. So Patrick, uh, what is what is the plan uh, for disseminating the information that you just gave us to the um, to the citizens of Montpelier? Great question. So the initial plan is to send a letter to everybody informing them about the project and explaining what we've just discussed. I'll also be coordinating with Kurt and Evelyn to get some social media postings up. Uh, those will be. Uh, a lot briefer than what we just discussed tonight. It'll be focused on bringing up awareness about the project and providing resources so that people could click on a link or be on the lookout for, for our letter ways to get more information if they want. And it'll have our contact information in there. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. Thank, thanks for coming and doing this. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. All right, we're up to item number 10, revisions to the fiscal year 2024 budget. So Sarah McCroy, finance director, is on her way up. Uh, we've talked about this a little bit over the last few weeks, uh, and Sarah will give the detail. This is the budget we are in now, and uh, our recommendations for how we manage it for the time being while we are anticipating shortfalls. So I will let Sarah, uh, who actually knows what she's talking about, walk us through this. Okay. Um, so I'm Sarah McCry, the finance director. Uh, this is the FY24 deficit mitigation plan that we've come up with internally and would like to uh, present to you. Our current circumstances in 24 are a bit difficult. We will likely experience a shortfall from two different sets of circumstances. One is the citywide reappraisal. Yep, that's the wrong set of slides. That's mine. That's the right one. So, um, like I said, two different sets of circumstances. The first is the reappraisal. We will experience some tax revenue loss there. The tax rate was set in late August based on the grand list as of that date. The Board of Civil Authority is currently reviewing the 69 appeals, and any assessed value that is reduced during that process will result in tax revenue loss in 24. Um, we also experienced the July flooding event, which devastated the downtown and severely impacted um, everyone involved. This, from this, we expect to see a significant number of abatement requests, which will also result in tax revenue loss. We also have lost meals and rooms tax related to the downtown businesses and have seen a big decline in department-related fees. Um, so here's where I'm showing you the uh, projected revenue shortfall. Um, and so here I've broken it down to property taxes, local options tax, which is meals and rooms, and then department-related fees. Um, and I performed estimates to, to come to these numbers based on what we know now. Um, that's so these don't include an abatement of education taxes. So I project we will have a $1.6 million loss in revenue. Um, we have two different items in the budget that are coming in over budget right now in revenue, so that offsets that slightly to get us to $1.5 million, which we will need to um, mitigate in order to avoid a deficit. But what's not included in that 1.5 is an abatement of education taxes. If the education taxes are abated, the city won't collect that revenue, but still is required to turn that over to the school. And so that could be an additional $1.2 million. Um, discussions are in the legislature right now about relief, but that's currently not known. But that is also something on the radar, but not included in this deficit mitigation plan. Does that typically, uh, there's probably no typical, but would we anticipate going for this in the Budget Adjustment Act? 
rather than. So uh, in 2011, after I the state did ad adopt a, a bill to help relief um, the education tax. It was a little bit more restrictive than what we would hope for. Uh, you had to meet four criteria in order for it to be exempted. Um, so the league is active. We've been active. There's already been a bill submitted. Um, what, what we would hope for is that, you know, any properties in a floodplain that, it, that achieve uh, balance the state would pay the, make up the ed tax difference. Um, but, you know, um, who knows? They'll, they'll do what they do. Yeah. Right. So, but it is, you know, significant because it would be 2.7 instead of 1.5. Um, so it, then we've come up with some proposed cost-saving measures of those. We would see department-wide reductions of around 330000 We would pause spending on the Country Club Road earmark. We would reduce capital projects funding by 519000 We would repurpose some committed fund balance, and we would repurpose some ARPA funds to get to that 1.5 and still be able to preserve our our unassigned fund balance and provide services to the community. Um, we are working internally to scale back as much as we can and still provide the services that are expected. And we all met and have agreed upon um, these proposed cost saving measures for you. And we've only been making purchases necessary to operations that were already under contract for projects and then for flood recovery. Um, so I've outlined these a little further. For the reductions by department, you can see the breakout. Um, the general fund wouldn't pay the parking fund for employee parking. Um, different departments have deferred supplies and maintenance. We have reduced the city hall maintenance and services budget because right now we're primarily focused on flood recovery and those would be FEMA eligible, so they wouldn't come from the general fund budget. Uh, we expect to see some savings from the vacancies we have in the open positions as we continue to keep those positions open. And again, I've broken down. We had three different lines where we were funding um, expenses related to the Country Club Road in 2024. And if we pause on the use of that funding at this time, that would help cover that gap. In addition, um, we reviewed what was in the capital fund. We carried over approximately 618000 from the prior year. Um, so if we partially fund CIP this year in the amount of 500000 and reduce it by 504470 um, That will also help us close that gap. And I've gone through the projects we have outstanding and under contract to determine how much I felt we needed to, to fund the capital and cover those and leave the rest um, for reserve. Um, so to do this, we have, as I said, reduced. We've repurposed the fund balance that we carried over and um, are deferring projects and equipment until the funding can be restored. And this was a decision we made immediately following the flood to try to conserve um, financial resources and be able to focus on flood recovery. And so I've also proposed repurposing $269,000 worth of ARPA funds. The um, yellow items in this presentation or in the agenda packet um, are the items we would place on hold in order to keep this money set aside as it is now allowed under the state and local fiscal recovery funds to be relief for disasters as opposed to just relief from the pandemic. So it is dual purpose now. And so if we can hold on some of these expenses and use this money to cover any shortfall we have, um, that would be, I, in my opinion, a great idea. Um, and I have left a few items here. Uh, one is the housing trust fund the first 60,000. Um, I've spoken with planning a bit We need to do a bit more research, but that's potentially money that could be used for the country club road expenses And then as we talked about earlier, there's 300,000 left which would be a, a great grant match for the rec center improvements that we discussed And then the last item I believe was a general fund committed fund balance so not that long ago, I came to you with a list of items you approved. Um, one option we would have is there are three items in there that aren't restricted by other outside sources. They are just committed internally by you as a council. And that's for the HRA reserve, the public works pavement marking, and planning professional services. And those are all things that could be repurposed to offset the impact this would have on our unassigned fund balance. So the main goals with this deficit mitigation plan are to continue to provide the community with essential services 
be prepared for a $1.5 million revenue shortfall and mitigate its impacts, preserve our $720,000 unassigned fund balance that we're carrying over from FY23. That number is still unaudited, so it's not final, um, but it is roughly where we will land. Uh, avoid reductions in personnel, closely monitor the budget and provide you all with regular updates and then restore the repurposed funds to their intended use as we learn more and if um, it doesn't turn out to be as bad as I have projected it to be. Um, so at this time, um, the recommended action would be that you review and approve the fiscal year 2024 general fund deficit mitigation plan as presented and outlined in the agenda packet and I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, do you have any questions? I mean, this this seems like a good plan to me. I guess just a couple. So, all the positions will be held open, so we're not cutting positions. We're just not filling them. But the plan is not to reduce staffing once we can get back to full budget, right? Um, and I guess my other question is just: Are there other opportunities either? in addition to the education fund advocacy for trying to, um, you know, not be on the hook for that additional 1.2 million um, from the education fund, are there other things or can we team up with other cities that have experienced revenue loss to try to get more state support and help? Um, and then just the other thought is, are there projects that we're putting on hold where there might be state funding or where we would miss kind of opportunities where we might want to like rethink timing of different projects or something because we could get state or federal funding that's available in the short term that won't be there in five years if we put it on hold? So, short, yes to all of the above. <laughs> um, okay. uh, I think with regard to the last question first, I mean, you know, as, as you see even with keeping the funds in for the, the rec center project, like if we see an opportunity to spend small money to get big money to do projects, you know, obviously that's how we're going to manage that. So absolutely, if we can move some of these forward, because, you know, one of the, the challenges we're going to have in the next agenda item is, you know, now we're going to have this backlog of projects mm -hmm. next year um, if, if they don't get done. So then it becomes a, you know, a burden on future budgets to get them done, just like we did with COVID. So how do we, how do we get those back? So yes, by all means, if we can find funds. Secondly, you know, I, I think I've copied you on it. If I didn't, I'm sorry. But right at, you know, not long after the flood, I reached out to our delegation and basically said, you know, can you provide us assistance um, for revenue loss? Much like the, the federal government did for everybody with ARPA. They said, you know, you have these res revenue loss. Um, and I know Barry City has done the same, others, you know, I, and I think, you know, if you look at the hand, the handful, I mean, there's like 20 or 30 communities that were heavily hit, you know, I mean, they give $20 million, which I wholeheartedly agree with, to businesses. Um, why couldn't they give $20 million to 20 communities, you know, allocated some pro rata function? But, you know, we specifically asked for a million, um, which would go a long way toward mitigating this. Uh, and that was before we had hard, hard numbers. Um, so I don't, you know, I don't know how that's going to play out. But um, like I said, the league is on it. And uh, you know, we're specifically in with Barry and um, trying to you know, get together with the other hard hit communities. So uh, yeah, that's absolutely an angle we're working. And I think the, you know, the important thing too, I mean, again, the wild card is the education tax, because that could make this go in a really bad direction. But Notwithstanding that, I think, you know, Sarah's been very conservative with with the numbers. So, you know, if things get a little better, um, we can try, you know, we'll certainly try to put particularly the projects back because that way they don't pile up for future years. Um, but we'll be keeping you pretty well informed and, uh, you know, not the place we thought we'd be in October, but here we are. Okay. So I know that we approved some bonding at the last town meeting at, that we haven't actually we haven't actually borrowed that money yet. Is that right? So part of it was Confluence Park could have been covered under that as well as some other things. We have, we passed a the city passed a, measure, a you know, ballot item that said right. we could borrow all this money, use it for a variety of things. So I'm just getting clear. We we have not actually borrowed that money, right? Correct. And I'm wondering. Um, 
how that fits into our current budget situation, but, but then also for next year. So um, those are two, two separate questions. I'll do my best to answer them. Uh, but Just Sarah a little louder. So, you know, the bond money then shows up as the, the debt service payments in future budgets. So, you know, the annual payment. Oh, sorry. Yeah. The bond payments show up in future budgets, you know, as the debt service payments over time. So, you know, we borrow a million dollars and then we pay, you know, so much per year for 20 years. Uh, so we don't start paying until we actually borrow. And we have that debt authorization. There's not really an expiration to it. So, you know, we can delay those. And so to the, our point, we aren't doing any projects we haven't already signed, you know, anything we hadn't already signed a contract and committed to do as of the flood, we're not doing. So that includes those types of projects. Now, you know, the Barry Main intersection, others, those are important projects. We've got to do them at some point, but we can push those off until we know. Uh, but, you know, in terms of next year, I, I, well, correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, I'm assuming we will at least start preparing next year's budget with the assumption that those payments are in and then that might be something that we choose to do is delay those through, through the budget processes how we stagger those any other questions I'm, i'll look to the public to see if there are any comments or questions I, i'd like to add two more comments if i may one is that we reviewed this with our entire team and everyone supported it. Um, you know, some people are getting hit harder than others. Uh, and it was very clear, it was said, not by me, but by others in the room. Like when we walk out of here, right, we're 100% we're on board with this and everyone was. Uh, and that just kind of, I think, speaks to the team that we have. And secondly, I want to call out Sarah. You know, Sarah just started, what, February? Um, and has, yeah. And, you know, she, her, her knowledge of our budget and handling all the FEMA stuff and being able to put this together uh, with everybody uh, has really been incredible. And she's been a huge asset to our team. So, I, you know, she's, she's done a lot of heavy lifting under, I, I'm not sure it's exactly what she signed on for, but uh, she's doing a great job. I signed up for a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> well, mission accomplished. <laughs> And one, just thinking of staffing that has capacity to actually go after other dollars, like are we, it seems like a wise investment to put, knowing that there are pots of money, so like that might be a place where yeah. you might want to hire right. capacity so that we could actually be seeking that money, because if we don't, it just means we're going to fall behind on everything, <laughs> and it's, right. we're already behind from the pandemic and all that. Well, and, and so to that point, because before you get to the second one, uh, you know, we're trying to be strategic. I mean, obviously, when this first happened, we just called uh, an immediate halt to all vacant positions because we needed to stop the bleeding. But, you know, as the year goes on, we're trying to be a little bit more strategic about it. As you, know, as you heard, you know, we're moving forward with the senior position because it's important and it's an important function and they don't have a lot of other staff, so they need that. Public Works has two vacancies. You know, winter's coming. We've given them the go ahead to you know hire one of them um, because they need it for plowing. And so we are trying. You know, when it makes sense, either for delivering services or for a need, um, you know, we're trying to be strategic about it. But obviously, it's also the biggest way to harvest savings is through you know not having those payments, and, you know, salaries and benefits and all of that. So, but not when it costs us the other way, so. Yes, really, thank you. And the way you laid it out it was made total sense and nothing that I objected to that I wanted you to put back in. Um, so I would make a motion that we accept your FY24 mitigation plan. Is there a second? The deficit mitigation plan. Is that deficit mitigation plan. Any make sure to put that in discussion? there. Uh -huh. um, for the country club, money so does that mean that project is basically just stalled out or what what does that mean for that project so it means that we will you know right now it's one of the other staff and of course we're we're really working with fema so that in itself has created some opportunities as well as um you know on one hand we think we'll be able to move some infrastructure ahead faster without us having to put money up 
on the other hand, uh, it will tie up some space for a period of time before we can move. So we think we can manage most, and if we can keep that sixty thousand in, you know, if we need consulting help, that's we, you know, we can do that. If we were if we were going full bore ahead, you know, we'd want to do all the full. You know, we've got a long list of things of action plans that need to be done and will cost money, but I mean, something's got to give. So, um, you know. Like I said, if we can get a water line put in, which we think we will, then that's $850,000 that we didn't pay for and didn't have to design and all of that, so. All right, are you ready for a vote? If so, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Now we move on to item 10. Or item 11, budget preview for fiscal 2025. Okay, so still Sarah Freud, the finance director. Um, here's the fiscal 2025 budget development presentation. Um, it's going to sound a lot of like a lot like the deficit mitigation plan. Um, for fiscal 25, we expect to face a lot of challenges um, in the budget build. Sorry. So the July flooding has caught a, caused unprecedented damage to the municipal and private buildings and infrastructure. The reappraisal appeal outcomes and flood related abatements will reduce tax revenue received in 24 and by default increase the tax rate for 25 without any increase in municipal spending. Um, the impact on this is still unknown. The local options tax receipts for meals and rooms and alcohol are expected to be significantly impacted by the temporary closure of many businesses during this current fiscal year and the unknown timeline for their return to normal operations in FY25. Um, also, many infrastructure improvements may be deferred as the city continues to focus on flood recovery and restoration. 3.75, or excuse me, 3.7% CPI will likely only cover the increase in personnel and benefit related costs the city is expected to incur for 25 and not inflationary increases in operating supplies and services. Um, for the budget build, we've made some assumptions for 25 as we do in every year. Um, at this time, we've tied growth and revenues to the consumer price index at 3.7%. Uh, we are assuming no change in the grand list at this time when we're contemplating this, but we know that there will be a reduction in the grand list value based on the reappraisal and the flood. Um, we are not budgeting to use any of our unrestricted fund balance. Salary and benefit projections will likely be absorbed by the CPI increase, but other expenses likely will not. Our health insurance is up 1.3% in the calendar year of 2024. They were originally projecting we would be 12 or 15%, so I signed the letter immediately when I received the 1.3% <laughs> increase. Um, but the second half of FY25 is still unknown, and our average is about 8 to 10%. Um, so we just will need to plan accordingly for that. Our CIP and equipment plans are going to have to be recalibrated due to flood recovery, as I just spoke about in our mit deficit mitigation planning. And then funding for community enhancements will, requir will require contemplation as we address flood recovery and core operational costs. Um, so in addition to the challenges assumptions, there are pressures. Our capital improvement plan has a $2.4 million target. This is an increase of 246500 over the fiscal year 23 capital plan. Um, our personnel also, um, with COLA adjustments related to the union agreements and other impacts, are expected to be an increase of 310000 gross, 250000 in the general fund. Over time, it's 36000 of that 250000 in the general fund. Our wage-based employer costs will be up another 54,000 gross and 43,000 in the general fund. Um, and these estimates here exclude the costs associated with filling the current vacancies. And we presently have eight that remain vacant under our post-flood hiring freeze. Um, should they be filled, that forecast would also increase. Um, our other operating equipment, building maintenance, utilities, fuel costs are all on the rise as well as supplies road salt and asphalt. 
Um, if we increase tax revenue by CPI at 3.7%, it results in a roughly $425,000 additional taxes raised. If we fill those eight vacant positions, we will likely have enough funds available to cover personnel increases, um, but not other inflationary costs or additional funding to the capital improvement plan. So here, um, you know, we really are looking for guidance from you all. Um, we are very early in the budget development process. We have some preliminary estimates, and we are building those around CPI, which is 3.7% right now, as well as our personnel costs from the contract agreements and our health insurance rates. Um, as I said, this is very preliminary, and departments have not reviewed their budgets or have made submissions, um, and there are significant challenges and pressures on the FY25 budget. Um, recent direction provided by Council has been to build the budget and come in at CPI, um, and I obviously I've already said that that may or may not cover the, the things we will want or need to do, and so we are looking for guidance from Council on their budgetary targets, priorities, and expectations for this upcoming budget cycle. Thanks, Sarah. Did you have anything to add at this point? So here we are, folks. We're, uh, we've done this. Obviously, we're going to spend a lot of time over the coming uh, couple of months going over what, uh, what we want to see in the budget. Uh, and at this stage, we've, we've done this a couple of different ways, including uh, having people say if they have any particular target budget target number in mind or whether you have any particular uh, programmatic and other priorities in mind and this discussion is going to proceed no matter what we say tonight no decisions are made tonight but but this is an opportunity for anyone to uh, to get out your initial thoughts if you have them Terry um. So I'm thinking about our overall budget process, and so we're right at the beginning of it. And I would, I would think that now would be a good time to get public input rather than waiting until we've already pretty much got a budget hashed out and then asking people what they think about it. So I would love it if we could do that right away before we get too far into setting priorities. And we could talk about our own priorities, but I really want to know what everybody else in Montpelier thinks and what their priorities are. OK. And the, so the, the way you would structure it would be if you get word out for, for a public hearing, like at our next meeting. I think that would be great, mm -hmm. yeah. The budget, budget forum or yep. something. Uh, Lauren. I like the idea of public input sooner I'm wondering if we might want to have a little more information. Like, I could see everybody coming in and be like, I want lower taxes and more services. Right. And, like, yep. Yep. like, we can't have Too both, broad. and, like, that's what everybody <laughs> wants. We would love to provide that, but we, like, just can't. And so I feel like there has to be more, like, to me, I would rather have the process, you know, have our departments and looking at our strategic plan, like, what are the needs that we identify and then maybe have like a better understanding of that without being tied to a specific number, but then knowing that we're gonna have to make hard decisions and it's gonna be a tough budget year. And so, you know, if we, you know, I know there's always some screening that happens by all the departments of some hard decisions before like we get to, but like, you know, what's, what's critical to provide the services at the level that our residents deserve and expect? It's a time, it's been a hard time. So like cutting back on services right now seems like the wrong thing for us to be doing. Like our community needs our city government right now um, to be stepping up, not stepping back. So um, I, I would rather approach it that way and know, I mean, you know, we, there, there becomes a reality check of like you just can't <laughs> like we, we don't want to raise taxes any more than we need to to provide really good services um, so and, and then I think within that kind of like projects and stuff again I think there could be things that could be like on the wish list or we're gonna seek outside funding for certain things or like or if, if we could find it then we would pursue it but it would be more you know the if if stars can align but it's not going to go into the base budget so I don't know I just don't want to start out with like a massive austerity mindset that we have to be cutting services and and things and, and I know we're going to have to make some really hard decisions <laughs> this year. 
Yeah. I mean, I do think we're really going to have to cut things to be realistic, looking at just basic, our biggest cost is labor. And with labor agreements, it seems like we have, and the cost of increase just for that alone, um, it's going to be really hard to keep all the programs running. And the question becomes, do you do this little cuts everywhere and, and dilute programs, or do we set priorities and say, these are the programs we have to provide and we want to do really well. And some of these others, rather than cut everybody a little, we will have to drop something. Because Montpelier has approved basically everything in, in the balance recently. We all know that. And everybody wants to be affordable and more services for less, but we just had really big tax increases this year. Um, ours were way above CPI on our, our properties. And I can't pass all those costs on to tenants for rents. And there's a place where it breaks. And I think we're there. So we need to be realistic. And so I do think we have to talk about cuts and how do we align some priorities. And is it programs or people versus um, just a lot of little cuts that just keep diluting things? Well, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, That's OK. <laughs> Donna. I, I know who you are. <laughs> I, I came on to the council in 2014 after council had insisted on staying at a certain percentage, and they did a lot of cuts. And they had inherited a lot of cuts, and that's why we were so behind on the roads. And they instituted the steady state that said every year we're putting $175,000 more into our roads program. So, you know, if we cut programs, you say, okay, not the paving, not the police, not the fire. <laughs> It's like, what do you have left? You, you just want more communication. People want more communication. It takes money. It takes a position. So I mean, I really would like people to, look, when they say cuts, and if we have public input early, then come to say, what do you want cut? What can you accept, accept cut from the budget? I'd rather hear that if we're going to have public input early than what they want to have versus what are they willing to have us cut. We couldn't even get them to take away snow plowing of sidewalks that we could all possibly take over the responsibility of shoveling ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, so when I hear cuts, I just I have a hard time visualizing what isn't a service that, that's necessary. Um, and you yourself talk about economic development. So it's like, and that's really hard to see the dollar right away. Um, so I, I'd like to have a, a little more like what Lauren was talking about, that we form some set that people react to fairly early, but not right off the top. That's just all. Anyway. So um, I'm just curious, because uh, Lauren mentioned a couple of times about federal grants. Uh, so is, is there any possibility that we can see what are available? and how much of them we can get. So I think it can give some idea to understand the budget, right? Because now it is only, oh, we can get federal grants, there are grants there, but there's no specific numbers. So is it possible to have some numbers? Sure. And then we can understand, yeah, this will go here, this item, so it will make the budget like better or, yeah. So grant funding typically comes with a specific project. Mm -hmm. So um, it might be that if we were successful, we could reduce, I mean, I'm making this up. We usually don't get paving grant, but let's just say we did. We got a million dollars for paving, grant for paving, then we could maybe not fund that at a million dollars next year. But really, so usually it's very discreet, like doing the senior center, uh, excuse me, the rec center, all that work. We, you know, we may or may not have budgeted for that next year, but this is an opportunity to get something done with a grant project. Our operating costs, personnel, salt, sand, you know, equipment, police cruisers, pu trucks, th those typically are not grant funded. Those are our operating costs. So, you know, we have, this is what we need to do to sort of meet the goals and priorities, and we're going to talk about the strategic plan next. How do we implement all of this, and what's the what's the right cost? You know, how much are we willing to pay for it, and so what what is included in that? And then sometimes we can get grant funding to do a work that's consistent with what we want to do above and beyond that. But it usually doesn't just fund 
a position or something like that. So it is inevitable then uh, tax increase because we cannot f find grants for operating uh, budget. Well, there's then we will we need to use tax right to make or it. or reduce expenses. I mean, it's you know, mm -hmm. I mean, if you if the council were to say we're not going to have a tax increase, I think what you basically heard was that's at least 425. You know, we're, we're expecting this growth so that you know that would go away plus. As things go up, we'd have to cut to accommodate for those. So, I mean, there's always a choice, and it's always a policy and a priority choice that you make. And one of the reasons we have this conversation early is we want to make sure we are thinking and working along with you. It's one of the reasons we do the strategic planning to make sure that what does get in the budget reflects something that you want to do, uh, not something else. So, um, and it's you know, it's always, you know, I think way back in when you all first started we did that orientation and we talked about the council's role as policy and the two you know the two biggest roles that you know the two biggest policies things you do are spending other people's money and regulating other people's property uh, or, or their behavior and so uh, this is this is really this is where you choose what's important for the community and how what that blend is and we're here to help you do that um, and obviously you know the the public process is great, and it's really important. And I do think having chunks of choices, because some there are some things that are very visible to the public and are very popular, and there are other things that aren't as visible but are perhaps as necessary. You know, the, the accounting office, right? People, you know, cut some of the people at City Hall. Well, you know, sure, but we have $20 million in FEMA and ARPA and all these things that we're managing, all these grants, so, you know, that's a that to a, an individual that doesn't mean you know well that's not going to affect my road plowing or anything but it's still an essential service so to some extent we have to think about what's important for operating the budget as well as um, but certainly packaging choices up like if you had this or this or this or you know and you know we actually rely a lot on that survey that we just went over the last meeting or two where the people kind of listed their highest priorities and their responses. So um, it's, you know, there's no perfect way to do it. We do have the ability on Zen City now on our website to get feedback from people. And I think that would be one way to maybe start a little bit early as we think about how to structure that, so. One of the things following up on what uh, what Sarah said for in a 2024 uh, update, but also for 2025, is that we've got bonded uh, bond approvals that uh, we haven't taken the bonds yet. We haven't uh, started paying yet, and uh, and so that's something that we could decide to push back a year or two or three years or whatever. However, the biggest bond. Well, we've got the sewer plant, and then the other biggest bond after that is the East State Street project, which is a huge project. At, and where do we hear the complaints? The condition of the roads and the East the State Street. breaks. Yeah, and, and those are both thing, things that are addressed by that bond. Well, so, and as you push projects off, the price goes up too. So there's, you yep. know, there's that cost. You know, you're, you're hedging one choice against the other. Again, that's what you have to do. Some I mean, we all do it with our own homes, and you know, can't do the roof this year. I know it's going to cost me more next year, but I can't do it this year, so I'm just going to deal with a leaky roof for another year. You know, I mean, I think that that's where people are at. So, um, it's it's not magic. I, you know, just in a little bit of a reality check about timing. Um, and not that we, and I do think we have the opportunity to get some early input, but you know, you have two more meetings. You have November 8, November 15, and we have the Thanksgiving holiday. The next meeting after that is December 13, and that's when we present the budget. So, you know, it's six weeks from now, but it's, you know, we're really going into our work right you know part this is the first part of our process really is getting having this conversation to get a sense of where people are at but it's going to come fast from, from here on out and so you know our opportunity to engage with the public is probably between 
the beginning of November and before Thanksgiving. You know, or maybe right after. I mean, by the time we get to after Thanksgiving, we've almost got a fully baked budget, which is what we don't want to get to. So, I mean, we just need to be think strategically about that, and we'll we'll put our heads together about how we can do that. I'm guessing, this is my first budget process, I'm guessing it's an iterative process. Um, given what, what people have been through, I, I think it, it would be um, a good first step would be a, a budget that doesn't increase taxes and see what that, what that means and then go back and take a look um, rather than the other way around. Um, I don't know how, how you've done it in the past, but um, since we're going to go through a process several times, we need a place to start. Uh, are, there other, are there other places we've started that have worked better than that? We've started almost any place you can imagine. Yeah. <laughs> um, we've started at that. We've started at, you know, inflation. That's been the most common one. Uh, we've started at just bring us your best guess. We've started at just the council saying, well, we'll accept some increase, but only like one and a half. You know, they've set a hard line, bring us a budget that matches this, and then taking a look at what the in impact mm -hmm. was. Um, so, you know, we, I mean, it's really how you want to proceed as a group, what, what you design with. Um, I'll say this. And it doesn't mean you shouldn't do it, but I think I'd be remiss not to say it. Um, if, if we say something like a zero increase, that almost certainly means staff reductions. And you, you go through a process where you have to make those decisions and identify certain positions, and now an employee knows that they've been put on the list, and then it comes to the council, and it's like, oh, well, we don't really want to do that after all and it gets put back. So it can be, I mean, it's its what happens. We're a public process. It's part of the deal, but it, it can be very difficult. And so if, you know, we could probably say something like at 0%, this is the, the magnitude of reduction, and these are the areas that we could see. But again, it, it kind of goes to Tim Stokeman, you know, are, how do you want it, or do you want it to say it comes from capital or no, we want to fully fund our capital plan no matter what, which means then which programs, how do you prioritize your program? So these, it's, it's, there's all sorts of choices in there sure. that, that are, you know, that you have to provide us along the way and that we'll suggest to you, but we can always change it based on what you want to do. What, the way I've been thinking about this, and I haven't spent, I'm not down the road very far far yet, but you know, I think the last couple of years, or maybe last year, I was just saying, well, you know, we we can't take on any more. We don't have the ability to, to ask people to ask our staff to do more than they've already done and ask pay, taxpayers to spend more than they've already uh, up, approved. Um, I don't I don't feel like we have a lot of extraneous stuff in the budget. I don't think we have stuff that people don't value. And so I think it's hard for me to say, well, to, to want to go into this planning on cuts, uh, cuts in services. And so if that means taking more money out of capital and out of services, that's probably my inclination. Uh, Lauren. Yeah, I mean, I'm just thinking like a range <laughs> like you know if you wanted to come in at no tax increase it would mean this kind of cuts if you wanted to come in at CPI it would mean this if you wanted to double CPI it would be this and then like we've got the menu we've got a better sense of the choices to make and um, you know it's a, so then, one of the things we can do in the past is um, and I'm saying we can do this. <laughs> <laughs> Subject. <laughs> yeah. really cool. um, one of the things we've done in the past, in fact, we would do, probably do anyway, is you know, sort of come up with 
like if we if we could fund everything, what does that look like? And then you know then we have a number that says all right this is this is fully funding everybody. This is you know fully funding the capital plan, fully funding everything in the strategic plan. This is kind of full. And then we'd say okay that would take a 10% increase or whatever because it will be something like that. And then we would say you know from there to get to you know. Uh, Inflation would mean cutting, you know, five hundred thousand dollars to get to zero. Would be cutting another four hundred thousand, you know, and and you could at least see where those things are, and you get order of magnitude dollars without saying specific proposals of, and then you know we could highlight where some of the big pockets of money are, and then you could have policy conversation about prioritizing. So that I mean, we typically do that anyway because people are going to submit their budget requests, and you know we. We whittle them down a little before they come to you to try to get to whatever target or expectation you know that we have. We we have typically tried taken it upon ourselves to not bring a budget to you that exceeded the inflation rate, just as a staff extra. Given l lacking any specific direction from you, that's probably what we would do if you didn't give us a different order. Mm -hmm. um, but we would also provide, you know, this is what's not in there. As some of you have done it before. You know, you get the budget. We say, here's what's not funded in this, because we're trying to stay. And then here's the things that are, or here's things that are increased, or those kind of things. So you can really see the change. But it's, there's no perfect system other than working through it. My sense is that more than I don't want to prematurely cut off the conversation, but my sense is that more than most years lately, people are all over the place. There's a <laughs> So we can we can keep talking for longer, but I don't think it's going to get you any more clarity on what the it's fine. where to start. I think we need your three choices. Yeah, it's fine. We but I, I don't want to cut people off. So Carrie, um, my my preference would be um, um, an increase that's a aligned with CPI and to have that be you know the place where we start. Um, I, I would love it if we could spare you having to go through the exercise of coming up with multiple budgets at different levels. But I think we can calculate be, the numbers. That's it would be not useful. Smart. It would it could it would be very interesting. But you just where I'm personally coming from is I think it's not unreasonable for taxes to go up, like everything else is going up, but not a lot more than that. So, but I'm open to to going either way too. Yeah. Tim, I think the thing to be careful of with CPI is because I looked at your report. I said, "Oh, okay, three point seven is interesting." You look at the chart, and there's no CPI. There's like a phone book of CPIs. Mm -hmm. and there's all kinds of indexes, and you use Northeast. And even within that group, it was like three point zero to three point seven. So there's a range. Yeah. Um, so it's, do we get something in the realistic range? Mm -hmm. I think makes sense. And then a lot of people in the community, their lives, their incomes don't increase by CPI. And so I think we've got to be cognizant of that. It's, I think last year CPI was used, right? That was the I base. So. And Those, I think what happened, I'd have to go back to confirm, but we presented a budget at what, and it was a high CPI last year, and then it got yeah. added too after it got to the budget. So right. there was more stuff was put in. Um, so I think that's what happened. So, so looking at rents going up at 2.5% or 3 and right. CPI went up at 8 or yeah. 8 point something. I mean, that's so I don't I think we've got to be careful with CPI. It's just not totally realistic for everybody in our community, or even maybe most people. Yeah, Donna. I was thinking though we actually didn't use the CPI until actually we, we put things in and put things out and then we measured it against whether it was reasonable within the CPI. It seemed to me we did a lot of exercises specifically moving because we had that wonderful spreadsheet that allowed us to play with some of the services and we could take things out, take things in, and, and we would see the impact on the taxes. And then we went to the CPI. I didn't feel the CPI led us there, but it's just my impression, or maybe that's how I used it. Yeah. I think yeah. I, yeah, I'd have to go back and check. I don't want to. But it gives us a, you know, some place to go. Yeah. I, I like that idea. Okay. All right. Well, your direction is as clear as you could possibly <laughs> want, right? <laughs> um, it's it's as clear as it usually is on October. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, Don. I, I just felt like uh, Carrie asked about public input earlier. Are you feeling all right about that? 
are we going to need to discuss it anymore? I think it's a great, you know, we'll, we'll try to come up with something that we can recommend okay. to you as how to do that, given the timing and what we know and where we know and all that kind of stuff. It's and, well, sometimes we have workshops that we add extra meetings for mm -hmm. that really invite a lot of public input. So. But do people ever come out before yeah. you, they see something they want that's being cut? Or on the chopping block, whatever the term? No, I would say at least a half a dozen and sometimes more. We haven't had large numbers of people. Oh yeah, sometimes we get 20. Yeah, I mean, the mo you're right. Usually, if there's something targeted to be cut, people will come out. Yeah. There is occasionally, sometimes, if something's proposed, people will come out and say, you know, we think you don't need that. You shouldn't do that. But we don't usually get a lot of people. But so I think that, that leads to we need to think about a different way to reach people. The one time that I remember a lot of people coming out was not when it was a budget hearing, but it was sometime about 20 years ago when we had this whole session of, um, of public meetings about uh, looking at looking at city government and how we should do. And we went through one of these dot exercises where people have the dots, and. And there were a lot of people. There was one of the sessions was at Capitol Plaza. I'm not sure yep. where all they were, but and it turned out that people mostly don't want to cut the services they get. Uh, and even though a few people come in and say, "Well, we've got too many city employees or whatever," there was weren't really people weren't wasn't that much constituency for doing something that's not what we already do. Because I the fact that people always vote yes on the budget and on the other things is an indication that people value what they get and or or at least in large numbers. Even this year I think our uh, our yes uh, vote went up. No? No. Okay. All right. Thanks. I think we're ready to move on. Gary had her hand up. No, oh, I'm sorry, Gary. No, that's fine. I, I just Thank didn't want to. Next up, we have item 12, strategic plan follow-up. So now we'll spend about two hours on the strategic plan. Everyone good for that? Wrap this up now that we know we can't afford anything that's in it. Um, so thank you for last week. Uh, I sent out notes this morning, um, trying to reflect what you had said. Um, and like I said in my email, these aren't, you haven't voted on any of them. And I, so there were a couple of things I wasn't even, you know, we weren't clear on from our notes, so we just put in what was said there. Um, I don't expect that we're gonna get into a substantive conversation right now. I guess I'd ask you just to look at these and see if they generally reflect what you think they're supposed to reflect and how and ask how you want to move forward with this. You know, do you want to schedule another special meeting? Do you want to put it on the next agenda? I mean, you know, how do you want to handle that, or do you want to discuss some of it tonight? Uh, it's really up to you. Um, we want to get it right, and it's um, and it's also important to as we think about the budget. We we certainly will go through the budget and say, is this in here? Is this in here? And then if something isn't, we'll tell you. You know, you had this in your plan, but it's not funded because of X, Y, Z. So um, my personal feeling is, and I don't have in my head a clear idea of what's on our agenda for our next meeting, but uh, but my thinking, my suggestion would be that we people take this home, spend more time than they've had so far to do it and put it on the next agenda if we if we can. But I'm happy to hear other suggestions. And it looks like I started talking while Lauren, you were raising your hand. No. Any other thoughts? All right. Other business. And Bill, and I, Bill, you and I talked about something under other business, didn't we? Yeah, I was going to do it under manager's report. Oh, okay. You, that's fine. Yeah. All right. City Council reports. Starting in your end. Okay. 
Uh, I do did have a meeting with the Parks Commission, and they have started opening new trails that are going to increase some of the parking on the street of neighborhoods that aren't used to having cars parked on the street going into the park. And so they're going to be planning ahead for some uh, public announcements and interface with people to hopefully not have uh, to have it go smoothly. And as those become more solidified, I'll bring the names of the trails, et cetera. And then the Central Vermont Public, uh, Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission, Transportation Advisory Group, trying not to use the initials, um, we got talking about dam removal on Tuesday night. So that was interesting. And all of us felt that the regional TAC should be the one to really support the towns and cities that want the dam removal, so at least investigated, to put pressure on the state. And they all quoted their own little reports for their towns or their villages, having that heard about this issue but not getting any state response. So uh, I just wanted you to know that's live and well and going to be growing. Um, I just want to report a little bit on the public restroom committee Ooh. meeting. Um, the, the committee looked at, talked a little bit about the proposals for the, the rec center building and thought that sounded great, um, but also wanted to make sure that any, any uh, the process for rebuilding City Hall um, keeps mm -hmm. the idea of publicly accessible restrooms in mind. Um, and, and I know that you know the, the proposals have come in from the RFP and the RFP didn't specifically say anything about fully accessible, you know, 24 hour a day public restrooms. Um, and so we just, the committee just really wants to talk about, they didn't make a formal proposal or anything, but that was the strong sentiment of the committee that that should continue to be part of those conversations. Thanks. That's it. So I'm not going to switch. Okay. Good. Um, <clears throat> and I, um, uh, meet with our um, constituents, uh, people who live in District 2 bi-monthly. And after the flood, uh, we um, haven't done it yet. So uh, this Saturday, we will meet uh, at the library at 10 a.m. So it will be soon on the front porch forum. And um, I hope um, people who live in District 2 can end can come and share ideas with us. So far, we have been learning so much things by listening to them. So that's all from uh, me and also Sal. <laughs> all right. Great, just wanted to share um, the Commission on the Recovery and Resilience uh, for our community has uh, been meeting. We've had two meetings so far. Um, there have been communications out to the public through press releases and some, and like, I know that they reached out to everyone whose email address they con collected through the various forums. So hopefully people are seeing those. Um, but so far it's really been kind of organizational and looking at the priorities that the community had identified in those processes and thinking about structurally how can we set up work groups to tap into broad expertise. So. You know, if we're looking at dams, we've got to connect with this, uh, our, our Regional Planning Commission group that, that Donna mentioned. So it's a lot of kind of mapping right now of different priorities and who can be helpful to pull in. And then um, the goal is then to reach back out because people at the forums had identified interest in volunteering. So um, just look out for um, opportunities to engage in that process once there's just a little more structure to plug into so we can move the community priorities forward. Great, thanks. Um, I have very little to say other than that I think it is, uh, it's very, the report on the Recreation Center was very encouraging tonight. And if we had the opportunity to meet some very fundamental uh, needs of people right in the center of town, I think that uh, we will, it'll be a great thing for the city if we can move forward and do that. City Clerk's Report. Just a um, reminder to keep coming to the assessment hearings. We're losing a couple. It was pretty close to a quorum last time, and we're losing a couple of our workhorses for at least next week or this week. But that this week will be nothing but traditional, normal uh, uh, assessment hearings, and there won't be a lot of strange math. Um, although <laughs> next week there could be. 
And just to mention that uh, November 2nd, since there's a conflict at the Senior Center, that Thursday we will be meeting here. Okay, I got a few things. Um, I think what Jack was referring to, you, I forwarded to you notice we got about the stump dump from the state, both from solid waste and wetlands. Don't have a huge lot uh, about of specifics. We have sent a letter back. Uh, we were asked to respond in the wetlands within 15 days, so basically saying, you know, we didn't know there was a wetland there. It's not mapped. Uh, and basically what we're asking for is a meeting with wetlands people and uh, solid waste people together so that we can figure out what, you know, that one solution doesn't get the other and what is actually needed uh, and what we may need to do, including whether we can continue keeping that open long term or open only for city functions. So there will be more to come on that. It will have an, it will have probably have some costs and will certainly have some service impacts as we go because uh, at least until we make corrective actions. So more to come on that. I, I don't have a lot of specific. Um, just heads up, we don't have this yet, but not nec the next meeting is on November 8th. That'll be here. The November 15 meeting, because the week after that's Thanksgiving and we're not meeting then, that's a school board night, so we will have to find another place. So I don't know where we'll have that's also got the cable. And maybe it'll be the senior center again. I don't know, but working on that. Um, the next meeting, you we just talked about the strategic plan, just so you know. Uh, the, the the Resiliency Commission, a couple of members will, the chair and I think deputy chair are gonna come just to connect with the council. I don't think it's gonna be long, but they'll, uh, we'll be going through the rec study about recreation services, the Ballard and King study. So Mr. Ballard will be here and the housing committee's recommendations will be coming up. So they've talked about regulating um, short-term rentals, a couple of things. So they're coming to present those to you. So those are the next along with the strategic plan. There's probably something else, but those are the ones I remembered off the top of my head. Um, also homelessness task Homelessness task force, right, they got it. communicated with us late, and actually right. I offered them the opportunity to be on next week okay. rather than t next time we're in tonight. There we go. Um, legislative slash advocacy committee. It's been Lauren, Jack, and it was Connor and me. Do we, did we know who this year's version is? I couldn't remember. You? Is it you? I'm trying to Well, it's usually three council members of me. So I, I, we should probably get together soon because we have a lot of asks, I think, this year. And, um, you know, I think normally we do that in November, right before the budget. You know, we try to, we try to set our legislative priorities and then ask our delegation to come in pre-session and go over them with them. So, um, so if we can get together. So is it is it Councilmember Brown? Yeah. Okay, great. Perfect. Um, and the mayor. Okay. And lastly, City Hall, um, to to Carrie's point, um, the RFP was searching for qualifications that met the FEMA requirements, but we have talked about um, when we're doing that, what other things can we do would it make sense to do that aren't like a new bathroom wouldn't be FEMA eligible, but does it make sense to do one while we're doing all this work in city hall? So that would be part of that process, but uh, the, it's specifically to deal with the mid flood mitigation and all that stuff. And we did get the, the bids in yesterday. Uh, we were going to try to have a recommendation for tonight, which was had been our original schedule, but we had th three bids in two are very strong. So they're going to do interviews and um, do more detail update for you. So that will be on the next agenda as a recommendation. So puts us a couple weeks behind, but uh, I think it'll be give us a better choice and more solid information to make a decision from because like I said there the, our team was really excited. So we had great proposals, so that'll be good. All right. That's all I have. And we are adjourned right at 10 p.m.